الأسرة الجامعية كما أود أن أشكر رئيسة الملتقى الدكتورة إلهام بزاوشة على اختيارها لهذا الموضوع وجدية عملها وكذلك الدكتورة إيمان محمودي وفوزي بالعالية دوما اللذان عاملة جاهدين على إنجاح هذا الملتقى أخيرا أود أن أحيي ضيوفنا المحليين والدوليين وزملائنا من مختلف الجامعات والمؤسسات ولدواعي الدبلوماسية كما تعرفون سأحيي زملائنا وضيوفنا باللغة الإنجليزية saying hello everyone it's my pleasure to meet you for this colloquium entitled diplomatic translation contemporary trends between practice and theory I would like to thank our rector, Professor Said Bumaiza, for his support and encouragement. I would like also to thank uh, the president of this colloquium, Dr. Ilham Bezawsha, for the choice of her, the, uh, the theme and the seriousness of her work. I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Iman Mahmoudi and Fouzi Bilalia uh, for their work uh, to make this colloquium a real success. I would like also to uh, greet our local and international guests and colleagues from uh, different universities and uh, institutions. And before starting the presentation, let me say some words about diplomacy and translation, dip uh, the diplomatic translation. Uh, diplomacy is an organized system of communication which allows states to act peacefully and conduct their affairs as well as their national negotiation or international negotiations in favor of a particular state or country. It's an area where symbolic power relations are often played out, characterized in particular by speeches representing peoples and nations. It's somehow a process of managing international relations through mediation. Diplomatic translation is an area which requires a high level of specialization. This area is characterized by confidentiality and deals with all types of speeches and documents. Therefore, diplomatic translator should have extensive knowledge of international affairs, in particular, the political, social, and economic situation of his country. He has also uh, the ease in uh, his expression. He should have an artistic talent to perform translation that best respect the meaning of the source message. As you see, having the uh, ethics in the diplomatic area implies many things, among which the high level or high degree of responsibility in many cases, work that must be of high quality and that often needs to be done with limited time frames. Diplomacy needs discretion. This is why it's important to point out if people do not often think about the work of the translator or the interpreter in the diplomatic area, it doesn't matter. It's even rather a good sign because it means that he's doing a real good job. So thank you for being with us. I believe we are all ready uh, to discuss and uh, have a collective reflection on contemporary trends of the diplomatic translation. So have a good conference. And the stage is yours, Fauzi and uh, Ilham. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, dear director. Ashkuruki jazila shukr, Sayyid al Mudira. Fauzi? Naam, Ustada. أسمعك نعم أشكرك جزيل الشكر أستاذة وأقدم الكلمة الآن للأستاذة بزوجة إلهام مديرة الملتقى ورئيسته تفضلي Yes I do I'm here and I hear you Let me um, allow Dr. إلهام بزوجة to speak السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام تفضلي أستاذة أود أن أشكركم على جهودكم الجبارة في محاولة لإنجاح هذا المؤتمر الدولي حول الترجمة الدبلوماسية ويسعدني أن يكون العميد والمديرة أستاذة عديلة بن عودة 
بين الأشخاص الذين شجعوني على وحفزوني على تنظيم هذا المؤتمر بعد الشكر أود أن أخبركم أننا من بين الجامعات الثقافة في من بين الجامعات السباقة في إعطاء الترجمة الدبلوماسية مكانة في المشوار الدبلوماسي للطالب في مشواره الترجمي. I'm going to switch to English now. And since we notice a lesser interest on behalf of academia in investigating diplomatic interpreting, unlike conference interpreting, police interpreting, immigration, that seem to have a sensitive and face threatening nature. Conference interpreting seems to gain the main exclusive concern of trainers and researchers in the 20th century. Diplomatic interpreting refers either to diplomacy and high-level meetings. We have opted for diplomatic interpreting comprising both diplomacy by conference in, at, in supranational bodies and one-to-one -one diplomacy between heads of state, ministers, and the like. Following neglect has compelled us to organize this conference. Unfortunately, not many of our students managed to defend their thesis in the field of diplomatic interpreting before of this scholarly neglect, and they always complain of the lack of references. In spite of its constant presence, in international relations and prominent role in the making of history, there is relatively little academic interest in research into, uh, into diplomatic interpreting. The motives for this low profile are not so surprising given the configuration of professional markets and training par priorities. Diplomatic interpreting remains a mysterious, is a mysterious serious branch, sorry, uh, of the profession. University trained conference interpreters, not diplomatic interpreters. Diplomats generally speak the language of the host country and interpret as a rule. There is also the component of secrecy, confidentiality, and the difficult access to the diplomatic world. All these elements have also contributed to the scarcity of research in this area. A step forward, as we have mentioned, might be the introduction of diplomatic interpreting research in postgraduate studies. We advocate the recognition of the speciality of diplomatic interpreting and call for focused research in the area. And we wish you all a happy learning today. Thank you so much. دكتور إلهام بزاوشا أشكرك جزيل الشكر على افتتاحك مع الدكتورة لأشغال هذا الملتقى وأشكر بدور الحضور وأشكر كل المتدخلين اليوم وأود أن أوضح بعض النقاط فيما يخص إدارة وتسيير هذه الأشغال أشغال الملتقى ففي البداية أنا لست وحيدا ستكون بمعية الدكتورة صابرين ارميلا وهي فهل أنت متواجدة معنا صابرين؟ آه نعم زميل بلعلا تحية طيبة آه يسعدني أن أكون قد زميل الأستاذ فوزي بلعلا في تنسيق جلسات المؤتمر آه وشكرا شكرا جزيلا يسعدني ايضا تواجدك هنا معنا لتسيير اشغال الملتقى الذي سوف لا محاله نستفيد منه جميعا واود ان اشير ايضا الى ان الملتقى منقول ايضا على المباشر في قنوات في في صفحه فيسبوك للمعهد وايضا عبر يوتيوب ولكن ثمت بعض الميزات الخاصه لهذه المنصه والتي ساشرحها فدعوني فقط في البدايه ان اتكلم باللغه الانجليزيه لاشرح الحضور الذين هم متواجدون معنا من الخارج والذين قد لا يفهمون اللغه العربيه ساشرح بعض الخصوصيات اللغويه التي ستسهل عليهم عمليه المتابعه ثم ساعيدها مره اخرى باللغه العربيه ل so first of all uh, allow me to uh, welcome 
uh, our guests, uh, the keynote speakers, and all the participants uh, present here with us. And um, I am addressing this message just for organizational um, uh, purposes. Uh, so I would like to say that the um, languages, the official languages of this conference will be Arabic, French, English, and Spanish. Yes, Arabic, French, English, and Spanish. So uh, I will try to speak Arabic with my colleague uh, during this um, um, this conference. Uh, and during the debates, there will be uh, English, Arabic, French, uh, and Spanish also. And um, about the uh, yeah uh, the uh, the language uh, barriers, we are trying to lift them um, by providing two kinds of uh, facilitators. First of all, we have the chat box. Let me just show you how to use translation inside the chat box. I will present. Yeah, just um, like you can see in the chat box or the discussion box, you have small flag this one so when you uh, click on this flag you will have uh, a list of languages you can choose your language the language you prefer to read the messages in and then you validate it by clicking on, on ok and you will have all the messages that you will receive translated automatically it is a machine translation into your language so everyone will be uh, able to follow the uh, the messages all the comments the questions and uh, additions uh, so uh, you can use it and you will receive the original message in its original language and the translation so this is the first um, language option so it is a machine translation. The second one is the one I'm proud about, and uh, it, it is the um, conference interpreting. So there will be interpreting into English, Arabic, French, and Spanish. And who are the interpreters? They are our dear students. So they are trainees. They will deliver interpreting into the different languages. Where will you find the, um, the interpreting and how to select? the interpreters and the languages. I will show you in, in a moment. Uh, but just before that, I would like to say that, uh, as I mentioned, the interpreters are our students. So um, they are in a training day and they are delivering translation to help us. The interpreting may not be uh, perfect. Uh, they are students, so please encourage them just like we are doing. Uh, and we are proud of them, all of them. They are helping uh, our participants to be here with us. So this way we will have interpreting and translation available in this diplomatic uh, translation meeting and uh, conference. So about the interpreting, how to select uh, the right language. I will present a small video just to show you how to do it from your desktop and from your phone. You can see that here you can select the uh, the um, the language from the audio and video box. There is a small icon with flags, the same as the one we showed before for the discussion, but this one is for audio and video. So you can select this uh, icon to pick the uh, interpreter and you click on choose and then you choose your language. For example, English and you have a slider just uh, below to move the volume down or up. Uh, you can move it left toward the interpreter to increase the interpreter's voice or to the right to increase the uh, original voice. And you can quit the uh, interpreting from selecting the same language and selecting disable interpreting. So this is how you Maybe can do it. And you can do it also from your phone. 
You can see from a phone of you, you have so the option, let me rewind. So uh, here the option is um, on the upper right side. You can select it and then في منح كل طفل محتاج الفرصة لتلقي وجبة مغذية في المدرسة بحلول العام 2030. You select the language and you have to uh, adjust the volume. So that's how interpreting works. And um, interpreting is delivered, as I said, by our students. Uh, some of them, let's not say some of them, but 90% of them are using or are participating for the first time in a conference. So uh, let's encourage them and let's give them a shout out. And uh, as I told you, dear students, it is a training day, so uh, no pressure. Just do the work like you used to do in the uh, Institute's lab. OK, so thank you so much. Everyone now can choose the language uh, they would like to receive a translation and interpreting in it. And I will switch back to Arabic. So thank you so much. إذا مثل ما شرحت الآن باللغة الإنجليزية للزملاء فإن الترجمة متوفرة باللغتين باللغة العربية واللغة عفوا في شكلين الترجمة التحريرية عن طريق ترجمة آلية متواجدة على مستوى الصندوق المحادثة وهنا يمكن لأي شخص أن يستفيد من الترجمة الآلية من خلال الضغط على هذه الأيقونة أيقونة الأعلام التي ترونها هنا بعد الضغط عليها يمكنكم أن تختاروا اللغة اللغة التي ستكون فيها الترجمة وبعد اختيار اللغة تفعلونها وستتلقون الترجمة في اللغة التي تودون اختيارها أما فيما يتعلق ب الترجمة الفورية فمثل ما رأيتم في الفيديو السابق يمكنكم اختيار اللغات من أيقونة مماثلة متواجدة على مستوى خانة الأوديو والفيديو ويمكنكم اختيار اللغة المناسبة للترجمة الفورية وعليه تتابعون الأشغال الملتقى باللغة التي تودون متابعتها فيها وبهذا أعتقد بأننا أتممنا الجانب اللغوي وفيما يتعلق بالحضور يمكنكم طرح الأسئلة في الخانة المخصصة لذلك وسنحاول نقل هذه الأسئلة في نهاية الجلسة عندما نشرع في النقاش سننقلها إلى إلى المعنيين بذلك وعليه أعتقد بأنني لا أدري إن كنت قد نسيت شيئا ما إذا كنت نسيت شيئا ذكريني أستاذ أرميلا أعتقد بأن هذا كل شيء لا أستاذ أرميلا لقد ذكرت يعني كل شيء أو النقاط المهمة التي التي اتفقنا عليها مشكور بالفعل فبعد بضع ثوان سنبدأ في الجلسة الأولى وهي الجلسة المخصصة إلى ثلاث مداخلات هي مداخلات الخاصة بالمتحدثين الشرفيين سنبدأ بعد ثوان سأقدم الكلمة للمتدخلين
Good morning. Hello, Hello. Cecilia. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We do hear you. So, Cecilia uh, Lipovac, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you are here with us and you are going to deliver the first uh, presentation. Um, so, um, I would like to give you the floor to start by giving us a small uh, a presentation uh, and uh, start in your, um, your slide, maybe, or I will show them from my side, no problem. Um, I don't see here the um, the function to share my slides. So, so you, oh wait, it's no here, problem. I will share it for you. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you to the organizers, first of all, for inviting me to join what I think is a very much needed um, conference about diplomatic interpreting, and also thank you to. Uh, the students that are interpreting for us today. I really appreciate it, especially because I don't speak Arabic. Um, we're going to be talking today about diplomatic interpreting, which I believe should be a specialization within our profession. If we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I, so think, I, I think that I you have the... I can do it myself. Uh, Perfect. Exactly. You have Thank the next you so and much. the previous. Okay. So just to introduce myself briefly, um, my name is Cecilia Lipovsek, and I'm from Argentina originally, although I live in London now. I have been doing so for almost seven years. I trained as a literary, technical and scientific translation translator of English and Spanish in Argentina. That's my uh, BA, uh, undergraduate degree, and then I have a postgraduate diploma on conference interpreting. And I relocated to London in 2015, where I run my own business called Multilateral, and I provide diplomatic interpreting services for the United Kingdom and Latin America, which is my field of expertise. In terms of languages, I'm Spanish A, English B, and Portuguese C. Um, we know interpreters are vital to the diplomatic process. This is one of the very few, because there are very, very few quotes by non-interpreters about the work that we do in diplomatic settings, which is already giving us an idea of um, how little recognition and how um, little awareness there is about the work that we do. S usually when uh, people picture or think about diplomatic interpreting, they th think of this, the United Nations at the conference, um, the main hall, interpreting there. But the th reality is that this is not diplomatic interpreting, not the way that I see it and not the way that I practice it. So what I want to share with you today is what I believe is diplomatic interpreting from a very practical point of view. Um, I'm not um, uh, a, speciali a specialist in theory of translation or interpreting. I'm a practicing interpreter and that's the experience that I would like to share with you today. The best example about the, uh, to, to illustrate this difference is actually the COP26, the climate change conference that happened only a few weeks ago here in the UK. I was at the COP26 providing diplomatic interpreting services. But this does not mean that I was at the COP where the conference was happening. Those uh, interpreting services were provided by conference interpreters working from the booth in the main assembly hall. And diplomatic interpreters like myself were actually working around the main event. So I was working with a client. We provided um, interpreting services for four different Latin American heads of state in what is called a fridge event. And you could also see diplomatic interpreters accompanying the delegations, working around the main session. And that is because when we are diplomatic interpreters, instead of being in the booth, we usually work in all kinds of settings. And these are some of the most common ones that I usually uh, find myself working in. Breakfast, lunches, 
maybe some lectures, a similar uh, sort of a somewhat conference setting on the go. So while traveling on a plane, cars, uh, sometimes a minivan or a bus, in meetings, in events, networking events, cocktails, bilateral situations that are more formal and they require other uh, kind of, um, of, of approach to these kind of settings. Very formal events like dinners and galas, visits to tours, expos, even art galleries, and since the pandemic, more and more so online as well. So considering all this, my theory and my thesis is that diplomatic interpreting should become a subfield of interpreting because it's entirely different. I am a conference interpreter. I do work as a conference interpreter as well, but the work that I do when I'm acting as a conference interpreter and when I'm acting as a diplomatic interpreter is completely different. Even what I carry in my handbag is different. And those are the differences that I'm going to highlight today. The way I see it, there are four areas where diplomatic interpreting is different from conference interpreting. And I'm using conference interpreter to compare it as a reference because that's the mainstream view of interpreting that we have. And is the highest level of interpreting training provided by universities today. So um, I think that that's a very good a point of reference to understand what act diplomatic interpreting actually is. The main difference has to do with the interpreting skills. The interpreting skills that I use when I'm working as a conference interpreter is simultaneous interpreting. I'm in the booth and I'm doing simultaneous interpreting from the booth, which is already a very complex thing to do and requires lots of training. However, when I'm working as a diplomatic interpreting, although I do use simultaneous interpretation very, very often, either because I'm doing whispering or I'm working from the booth in case of a lecture or a, an event or a speech, or sometimes I'm using portable gear, like tour guide sets, I'm doing simultaneous interpreting. But more than half the time, I'm not doing simultaneous. I'm doing consecutive interpreting, either long consecutive interpreting with note taking, which is the more traditional approach and what we see in those um, highest level situations, such as, for example, uh, a bilateral press conference and anybody who follows the news from Latin America, that's my area of expertise. This week was this um, anecdote about the Mexican president who spoke for eight and a half minutes and the interpreter was taking notes and then working with long uh, consecutive interpreting. I also use short consecutive interpreting, what is normally known as dialogue, but sometimes I'm just doing memory because I don't even have time to get my notepad out or because it's um, uh, an impromptu exchange that happened, for example, while we were walking down a corridor, which happens a lot and quite often. I also need to be very good at sight translation because I might be handed a document that I need to cite translate. Uh, speeches, you may get a copy of a speech that you're about to interpret, and you get the copy of the speech 60 seconds before the speech is given. So you cannot prepare it in advance as you would when you get the documents for a conference. So I'm doing a combination of simultaneous with note taking based on my site translation of the speed. And then many other situations where I say miscellaneous, for example, you end up um, interpreting or translating the lunch menu or um, some brochure or information that the client is handed. The biggest difference and problem with this is that 
at least in Europe, all training programs for high level interpreting are conference interpreting. And the focus is 80% and sometimes more than that on simultaneous interpretation, which means that there are very, very few interpreters who can do consecutive, especially the long form with no taking. And I know this because in the London market with my languages, there are less than five colleagues, Spanish interpreters that I know can do long consecutive and I can call when I need somebody to work with me. So this is a big area of a uh, big opportunity to explore for those who want to grow into diplomatic interpreting. You need to have good consecutive interpreting skills. Otherwise, you are done. And the same with um, the other big three, the other two, simultaneous and site translation. And you also need to be able to switch from one to the other very quickly. Because throughout the day, it may be that you are accompanying a delegation and you are doing whispering during a breakfast meeting, followed by a press conference where you are using short dialogue, short consecutive. And then there's a lunch where you go back to whispering. And after lunch, there's a meeting where you're using the portable um, tour guide set. And then in the evening, there's a lecture where you go into the booth and you do simultaneous. And then um, after the lecture, there's a cocktail where you are doing um, what I call face saving interpreting that I will explain in a moment, accompanying um, your client while networking. So throughout the day, you not only need to be good at each of these, you need to be able to move from one to the other as well as decide which is the best type of interpretation for each single moment of the day. Another big difference, and this is, I believe, perhaps the biggest difference between diplomatic interpreting and conference interpreting, is the role of the interpreter. And of this, the biggest, biggest difference is the fact that diplomatic interpreters are not in the booth. When we work as conference interpreters, even depending on the venue, we use a separate door. We go in, I sit in the booth, I'm behind the glass, I'm interpreting from there, and my interaction during the day or the week that I'm working at a conference is mainly with my colleagues, with the other interpreters, working for this conference or this event. Now, that protective glass that keeps us separate from the audience and the participants in a conference disappears when we are working as diplomatic interpreters. So we need to start minding this gap because without a glass, we are exposed. It's incredibly interesting because we get to connect with the client a lot more. But because we are going with them from one place to another, accompanying them through stressful times, and you get to build a relationship with your client, but with closer interaction comes greater risk, especially when it comes to neutrality. So we have off time, maybe we're traveling, and they're sitting, we are sitting in the car with them and they would ask questions and you're chit chatting or they would just ask your opinion about a meeting or how it went or they will ask you for your advice. So you need to be very much aware of how you're managing those situations because you need to stay neutral. You can't uh, tip the balance in whatever interaction is happening. It will depend on the people you are interacting with, and it will also depend on the level of formality of the delegation and the situation you are interpreting in, which is another characteristic that is key for diplomatic interpreting. Conferences 
after a while, I believe anyone who has a few years of conference interpreting under their belt will agree with me, is sort of a genre in itself. So it's a standard language. We, need, we, we aim to be as clear as possible for everyone. And it's like a format. It's pretty much the same all the time. Diplomatic interpreters, we tend to think heads of state, royalty, and Nobel Prize winners. So we tend to believe that that's all that diplomatic interpreting is. But the truth is that there are many different levels to a government. So you may be doing interpretation for a head of state, but you may also be working at the ministerial level, or you may accompany technical staff if it is a technical mission. So I had, working in London, interpreted in places where they would be serving a seven-course silver service lunch, like super high-end, and going in a private car with security and convoys and everything. But I have also interpreted technical delegations that we were having sandwiches from the supermarket on the bus, traveling and taking the London Underground. So you need to be able to understand this level of formality because it also affects the language we use, but it also affects how we interact with the client and even the services that we provide. Something that is at the presidential level is going to be managed by the presidential team. So you will deal with protocol staff, with security and so on. We'll talk about this also in a moment. But if you're working at the ministerial level, it tends to be more casual. So you may even end up having uh, drinks um, after work at the end of the week. And that is another chance for neutrality to get compromised if you sort of start spilling the beans and sharing things that you shouldn't. So levels of formality and how that affects the work is another thing to keep in mind. Another difference with diplomatic interpreting when it comes to our role is that because we are not removed from the situation, our role as bridges is highlighted. So there's a lot more, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot more of cross-cultural support in diplomatic interpreting than there is when you're doing conference. When you're doing conference work, you get the PowerPoint presentations, you get the documents, you study them, and, and please take this with a pinch of salt. This is just my personal perception. But working in the booth, having trained and worked as a translator myself, for me, it's like translating orally. Instead of that, with the exception that instead of being home, translating and typing, I'm sitting in the, in the booth interpreting. But now we're sitting home interpreting because of the pandemic. So it's a different exercise, but the approach is similar. When I'm doing diplomatic work, there's a lot of cross-cultural awareness that is involved. Not only because we are walking around London and I get asked, what is that? And then I said, okay, that's Westminster Cathedral and so on. But also in my own renditions as an interpreter. To give you an example, a few years back, I was interpreting for the... Um, Ministry of Economy from Mexico. And the minister spoke English. I will address this English thing in the next item. And he was telling in a meeting after lunch that during the lunch break, he went to, and this is what he said in English, I went to Waitrose to see how many Mexican products they carried. My job the day was interpreting for the chair of the biggest chamber of commerce in Mexico, who didn't speak English and who didn't know what Waitrose was. Waitrose is a, a sort of a high-end supermarket in the UK. 
So my own interpreting rendition included, literally, I went to Waitrose, the supermarket, to check how many prox Mexican products you carried. And there is this cross-cultural um, uh, mediation that is part of my own rendition as an interpreter. You can also provide ad hoc intercultural advice, the form of protocol or etiquette or um, emphasizing Latin Americans are not necessarily very punctual. The English are incredibly punctual. So those kind of, the, of um, advice and other types of more complex advice as well matter. But sometimes as well spotting those problematic areas where the message would not get through. Another example, and this was a technical mission, but it happens also at high level missions. We were, it was something related to um, the legal system and uh, legal provisions and uh, civil rights and human rights. And the um, English counterpart said they even have the right to a barrister. Now, a barrister is a type of lawyer in the UK that is unique to the British legal system. If I translated that into Spanish, tienen derecho a un abogado, which literally is they have the right to a lawyer, it wouldn't have carried the same meaning because they have the right to a lawyer um, in Latin America and the UK is a given. So why would this English government official mention it at something worse, worth noticing if it's just the right to a lawyer? Now, this was too big for me to do the same thing that I did with Waitrose the supermarket. And because it was a meeting, so you need to assess the setting, you need to assess the level of formality, and you need to make a decision just as when you are translating. And I did what you would call like a footnote for translators. So I stopped the, the meeting for a moment and I explained that the figure of a barrister does not exist in Latin America and therefore should be explained. So the English uh, government official added a brief explanation and the conversation continued. So this is the role as, as uh, intercultural agents that diplomatic interpreters sometimes play. If it is a very high level thing, obviously you can't interrupt, but you can have a set aside, or you can whisper something to, or pass a note to some of the aides, and they would see that the head of state receives the message if there's a very dangerous faux pas. And then um, this is um, a term of my own coning, coning that may not be very um, scientific, but I do this a lot. And I call this type of interpreting face saving interpreting. So when you are doing conference, you go into the booth and you just interpret everything that's said. And then people want to listen to us, great. If they don't, they just listen to the speaker. We don't have control over it. But when you are accompanying delegations and when you are accompanying uh, dignitaries, it depends on what they need. And especially when English is one of the languages, people would often come and say, I speak English or I understand English. I don't need you to interpret the English into Spanish, but I want you to interpret my Spanish into English because I don't like my accent or because I don't want to start stammering or struggling for words. I'd rather you do it. Sometimes they just want to have time to think and that's where we are, a buffer giving them time to think before responding because they are waiting for the interpretation. And another thing that happens a lot is that I get many clients who say, I understand English, as long as it's clear. And then they come to the UK and they get somebody from the north of England or Scotland or Ireland or somebody who is um, 
uh, has a strong, let's say, African accent or Asian accent in English, and they don't understand them. So this means that sometimes during the day, I'm not always interpreting. They just select when they need my help and when not. And this requires a different understanding of my role as an interpreter. I'm not there to interpret everything. I'm there to interpret what they need. And that's a support, it's a different type of support we provide to our clients. Third area of differentiation, our supplementary skills. There's a lot more to interpreting than just languages. We all know that. But when we are working in diplomatic settings, we need to bring a lot more to the table because of the myriad of situations that we find ourselves in. So I talked about language. We need to have a very, very, very good command of all our languages, working languages, especially because in diplomatic settings, nuance matters. To give you an idea, um, I was a couple of years ago with the previous Argentine government interpreting for the vice president. The vice president had a very important meeting with the English counterparts where they were going to discuss some thorny issues between both countries. So they sat down, the Argentine delegation, this side of the table, the uh, Br English, the British delegation, the other side of the table. And that meeting was the only one. I was using a tour guide set, so I was working simultaneously. And it was the only meeting where the entire Argentine delegation, including the ambassadors and the embassy ministers, put on the earphones to listen to my rendition. They were measuring the words that I was using when interpreting. So when we are doing conference, we should be as accurate as possible, always. But we have some leeway sometimes. When we are doing diplomatic interpretation, there's no leeway because a single word or a single nuance can affect everything. So we need to keep that in mind. Regionalisms matter. I work with Latin America, so Spanish is not the same one across the continent. And I always joke, I often joke, that it's easier to interpret world peace than it is to interpret the lunch menu because Something as simple as sweet potatoes or beetroot has different words, different languages. So expressions, idiomatic expressions, colloquialisms, humor, even varies from country to country, even though we are all speaking Spanish. And then we need to have a very good grasp of register, especially because we're working with different levels of formality. We need to understand this course. This course analysis is very useful, especially because we're usually working with the same types of discourse, political discourse, pitching when they are you know, presenting countries or proposals or um, companies and technical discourse. These are different ways of expressing that help us anticipate how people are going to communicate. We need to learn intercultural communication, the different dimensions of uh, intercultural um, interactions, how to express local color, something that comes from translation, especially translating literature, has a role to play here. And we also need to be able to read the situation and the context from both points of view. To a Latin American arriving 10 minutes late is okay. To a Brit, to an English person, arriving 10 minutes late is an insult. So this is a very basic example, but it illustrates how we need to understand the role culture plays in our communication. We need to know protocol and etiquette. Not, I'm not talking about table manners. I'm not talking about how to you know, decorate your Christmas table or whatever else, but we need to know titles, ranks in, on both sides, 
So what do they mean? And we often have this thing, at least between Latin America and the UK, where the uh, ministry in Latin America is sort of the highest government official within a ministry. And in the UK, that highest level is a secretary. So unless when I'm translating into English, I say a minister of state, the English counterpart will say, why am I the top level, um, the, 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 the top level most senior official in my ministry or my secretary, my secretariat, and now I'm meeting with somebody from a lower rank. So you need to be very mindful of this. You need to be mindful and know how to handle forms of address in different countries. And another thing that's very useful for us is precedence. Because precedence is going to let us know very quickly where our clients are going to be, which side of the room they're going to be sitting on. You, we don't want to be on the right, wrong side of the room and then have to cross in front the entire press corps because we were on the left side of the room and we needed to be on the right side of the room. It would help us. Sometimes you had to sort of weep, you know, and find your way um, around the, the people, around the dignitary that we are interpreting for. So we need to know which way the person is going to enter or where they're going to be standing. So precedence is important. Group dynamics, especially when we are accompanying entire delegations, hierarchy, roles within group dynamics, is not... I would say the, a mandatory skill, but it's one that I found very useful. And then we need to have incredible public speaking skills ourselves, because we will always be, there's no, usually there's no sound technician and we are not in the booth where the microphones and the consoles are all the same, or we are not like I'm now in an environment that I know and that I control. I might be on stage, I might be off stage. I might be using a, a unidirectional microphone. I might be using a lapel microphone. I might not be using a microphone. Uh, uh, so you need to be able to, first of all, speak. You need to control your voice. You need to be able to project your voice. And we need to be able to communicate with our voice what the person we're interpreting is saying. We need to be able to handle ourselves on stage and all of these while also managing the flow of the conversation. So we need to be, you know, very, very confident in what we are doing. And we have to be aware of our own body language. Our body language can betray what we are thinking and our opinion of what is being said, even if we don't want to. Or, and this is live and learn, uh, we might be so lost in what we are doing, so immersed in what we are doing, taking notes and thinking and translating and interpreting that we don't realize that we are sitting, looking like the hunchback, the hunchback of Notre Dame um, because our backs are not straight. So we are communicating something that is not what we our client is trying to communicate. So we are a reflection on them. We need to be careful with this as well. And finally, we need to have certain personal attributes. I have colleagues who are conference interpreters that are tremendous conference interpreters. They are incredibly good interpreters and they could be very good diplomatic interpreters, except that they don't like it. Or they say, I don't want the exposure I don't want the stress. I want to go into the booth, my control environment, and I'm happy with that. Perfectly fine. But if you want to work in diplomatic interpreting, you need to have tempo. You need to have poise. You need to be able to manage stress like the best. You need to be incredibly resourceful. resourceful. You may think you have everything going on and then you get to the room and somebody turns on a camera or a very powerful light and it causes interference with the equipment that you're using and you need to resort to something else. And you also need to be very, very humble 
and confident because one of the reasons sometimes why interpreters are in the room is to serve as scapegoats, especially in very tense negotiations. So we might be blamed for things that we didn't do, misunderstandings we didn't create, just because it is a negotiation, a negotiating tactic. So if we, you can't take it personally, so it all has to be to do with our, our own selves and our own personality and our own character. Personal image. I said a moment ago, I know I'm a reflection of my clients. So suits, hair, makeup, depending on the cultures you're working with, where you're going, but you need to be impeccable in your personal image. As in, I mean, this does not mean that you have to look like a supermodel. It just means that you have to be presentable, professional, but also don't draw attention to yourself. So little makeup, little, you know, no, not many accessories, whatever applies to the country you're working with. And be mindful of your body language. I know we usually don't like to listen to our own voice recorded. I hate it. But I, I forced myself years ago to listen to myself and um, be very much aware of what I sound like and when my voice betrays me. And the same with my body language, my stance. All of that is communicating something. And it has to communicate what my client is saying and not something that's happening in my head. Fourth and last point of difference, the day to day. So when we work as conference interpreters, sometimes we are booked months in advance. We are sending materials. And we know that we have a schedule. There's um, an order of the day. We know we have to be somewhere in, in the venue at a certain time. We go into the booth. We work with our booth mate. We have our coffee breaks. We have the you know toilets nearby. And then we go back home or to the hotel. And we do our thing. Working as a diplomatic interpreter is nothing like that. First of all, you need to be incredible, incredibly, incredibly flexible with your scheduling. So you may be um, ready to interpret at 10 a.m. in the morning for a meeting, and the meeting gets canceled, rescheduled, postponed, um, moved to another venue. If it's going to be face-to-face, -face, it may be moved online. It may be shorter, it may be longer. So whatever happens, you need to know that it's not going to be like what we are used to when we're doing conference interpreting. You also need to be very flexible with the settings. I showed you earlier. So I have interpreted, and I'm not kidding, on the London Eye. I remember was uh, with a visiting delegation they had a meeting scheduled mid-morning. The meeting got canceled because there was something going on in, in the UK. And then they had, their delegation had uh, a little bit of, you know, time off in the afternoon. And they were invited to write the London Eye. And when we were waiting and just about to go in, they said that the people that had canceled the meeting in the morning were free if they wanted to talk to them, which they, you know, these people wanted to do. They wanted to talk to the visiting delegation and whether they would mind doing it while riding the London Eye. So it was a big delegation. So there was only us in the bubbles, in the capsule on the London Eye. And we had the meeting there. And the meeting was a little bit of the meeting. It was a very informal, casual interaction, but it had to be interpreted. So it was a little bit of the meeting, a little bit of that's the big band, that's the um, whatever building, and then a little bit more discussion. So those things are going to happen. Obviously, the higher the government level, the um, 
less impromptu things, so you're not going to end up interpreting on the land on I, but there will be delays, there will be waiting time, there will be meetings move around, there will be people that maybe you had studied because they, you knew they were coming and meeting with the head of state that do not meet. So all those things could happen. And the settings where you find yourself interpreting could change as well. And they are as various as you can imagine. So you need to be ready to deal with all of that. And that means that you might be thinking, okay, I'll use a tour guide set because it's better for this or better for that. But then you cannot do that. So you have to take out your notepad and start doing uh, your note taking. Or it might be that you are used to using your tablet or you're used to do these, um, use these pencils for sim consec but you go into a um, high security building, you have to leave all your technology at the door, so you need to make do with pen and paper. So you need to be very, very flexible and able to think on your feet. Confidentiality. I can't stress confidentiality enough. And yes, I know that nobody or no interpreter in the right, you know, in the right mind it's going to share the content of what is said. We all know that. But personally, I have a very strict policy of not sharing absolutely anything about the work I do. Even if I'm checking in in a venue or a hotel and I want to use the Wi-Fi, I don't even use my Facebook to access that because that picks up my location. So when you're doing diplomatic work, Sometimes even hinting that a meeting took place is a breach of confidentiality. So this is something you have to be very strict. The same as photos. The innocent selfie could be sharing things like doors, windows, a number of people, a name that if you blow out the photo can be read, perhaps some notes on the on the table. So you, you can't share anything and you have to be very, very much aware of it to the point that being super strict about this is the point of sales. So it's even good for your marketing. You also have to be very aware of the spatial issue because you're not in the booth. So you are surrounded by people and depending on the level of um, diplomatic interpreting you're doing, you will have to deal, for example, with security details. And the security detail, you have to learn to work with them, first of all, because they can block you from going in, but also because they have to be close to the person they are protecting. But I had to be close to them as well, because sometimes I had to whisper for them and I had to hear what they are saying. So security, um, uh, the security staff and the interpreters are sort of fighting for the same real state around the person. So you need to find ways to very quickly establish a connection and collaborate with them. Photographers are, are another thing. If you're working with somebody that has a high profile and photos have been taken, I mean, nobody wants the interpreter in the photo. I'm not particularly interested in being in photos as well. So because I'm short, I'm usually hiding behind people. So any job that I've done, it, I'm hiding behind the person I'm interpreting for. And the photographers are grateful for it, which doesn't hurt, especially because they can perhaps um, bring you a bottle of, you know, some water if you need it or um, help you out. And also, I think it's a nice thing to do to be also mindful of their work. But all of this is happening around us while we are working and the personal space personal space the, of the person that we are interpreting for and respecting it means i mean don't touch them if they don't want to if you're doing whispering uh don't have garlicky food for lunch i mean i'm no kidding or or something that um m might you know give you bad breath so because you are very close to them when you are interpreting so having said all these and noticing all the differences between conference interpreting and diplomatic interpreting, 
and seeing the offer that's currently available, I think, and I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the opening remarks today, that we have to bring diplomatic interpreting to the table and start creating programs at universities that include the skills that we uh, that I just mentioned, starting with interpreting skills that truly prepare interpreters for diplomatic work. I think that many um, master courses, uh, master level courses, or even postgraduate or undergraduate could update their curricula. And I think that there should be ongoing training by universities of professional associations covering these skills. Professional associations need to update their professional conduct codes and working conditions guidelines. What is now available in the market is not suitable for diplomatic work. You don't always need or can have two interpreters to work as a team because of security reasons, logistic, the logistics of the event. Sometimes you're working alone. Most often you're working alone. So, and um, overtime is something that, how do you measure overtime when the schedule is move around all the time? How do you um, provide guidelines for neutrality when the glass that's protecting interpreters is no longer there? So those are things that are missing in the professional conduct codes and the working conditions guidelines of all professional associations I have ever belonged to. And I think that interpreters need to be very, very self-aware of what we can do and what they can't. And if you feel you are good at SIM because you have your training, but you are not very confident with your consecutive skills, then be very honest about those skills. And if you wish to pursue work as a diplomatic interpreter, get the skills first and then pursue work. Because otherwise you could end up in a very, very big mess, not only for your reputation, but from a legal standing, you could even be sued if there's only one chance for a meeting and it doesn't go well because you couldn't hold up. Uh, so you need to be very honest about that. We all know that we can't fake interpreting. So prepare yourselves, get the training, get the skills, know yourself incredibly well, know whether you can stand the heat, where you can remain calm, and where you would like to do this work or not. Maybe you should say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want the hassle. I don't want to be uh, exposed this much. So this is not for me. I know that I love it. And uh, it's a, my favorite type of interpreting to do, but it's entirely up to each of us, what we do and how we grow our careers. So I believe that's it from me. You can obviously get in touch um, on LinkedIn. So you're happy to connect. You can visit my website if you want, or if you have any questions that we cannot cover during this conference today, and you want to send me an email, feel free to do so as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for the tremendous work, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, with uh, all these information, uh, so um, thank you again. Um, You're welcome. My pleasure. I I hope you will still be you will stay with us. Uh, there will be a, a discussion later. Yes, of um, course. Yeah, a debate. So the questions will be asked later. Le Perfect. Now we will move to the second presentation. Thank you. Hey, then, and. Thank you so much. سننتقل الآن إلى مداخلة الأستاذ نولان جيمس نولان من الولايات المتحدة لم يتمكن من التواجد معنا هنا وذلك لأن هناك مشكل في التوقيت لأن الوقت مبكر جدا في الولايات المتحدة الآن هو في نيويورك وبالتالي لدينا لدينا هنا فيديو قام ب إعداده وتحضيره لنا وبالتالي سننشر الفيديو على أساس مداخلة كاملة وبالتالي من هو جيمس نولان هو مترجم من كبير مترجمين في 
الأمم المتحدة عمل في عدة أقسام في الأمم المتحدة ولديه عدة مؤلفات من بينها techniques and exercises وأيضا essays on conference interpreting ولقد درس أيضا في عدة جامعات من بينها جامعة ماريمونت وجامعة نيويورك و جلاندن كوليج يونيفرسيتي اوف اوتاوا وعده جامعات اخرى عمل فيها كزائر وقدم العديد من الاعمال ايضا وسنحاول ان نقدم الفيديو للاسف نوعيه الفيديو في الصوت ثمه مشكل ايضا يعني في نوعيه الصوت ولكن هو مفهوم وسنحاول ان نستفيد من هذه المداخله Good morning, colleagues. Before starting my presentation, I have a technical note. Most of the supporting uh, information, the background supporting information for this presentation will be found in the footnotes. And that will appear in the printed version of the presentation uh, in the uh, uh, proceedings of the conference that will be printed by the uh, University of Algeria. Multilingual communication and creative language use and diplomatic interpreting. Definition of diplomacy from the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English. Diplomacy, one, <clears throat> the art and practice of establishing and continuing relations between nations. Two, skill at dealing with people and getting them to agree. Conference interpreting, also known as diplomatic interpreting, has become the main modality of multilateral debate in large multilingual diplomatic gatherings. Despite its importance, some perceive it as an extra extravagant luxury or do not understand its purpose, sometimes confusing it or comparing it with translation. This is understandable given the fact that some of what the translator does involves interpreting the speech and, and some it involves interpreting the text and some of what an interpreter does involves translating the speech. Recently, however, there has been a speculation that machine translation, MT, combined with voice recognition software could someday lead to a form of automated interpretation, an ill-advised futuristic view. While digital technology can be used to conveniently control home appliances or applications on a cell phone, or to give voice activation instructions to a speaker or a GPS, it cannot be used in the UN Security Council to defuse a crisis or resolve a non-proliferation issue, or in the Human Rights Council to address human rights violations, because diplomacy is not a game and is governed by international law, not by local law or custom, or by the profit motive. If international relations were allowed to deteriorate in order to cater to entities with a vested interest in promoting technology per se, the international community would be abdicating its responsibility and betray, betraying the trust that the interpreting profession has earned through many years of faithful service. The word diplomacy, a term we conveniently use to refer concisely to international relations and the intergovernmental contact, exchanges, agreements, and institutions they engender, has the secondary meaning of dealing with people and getting them to agree. This is no coincidence. The former cannot exist without the latter. And failure to communicate 
and interact can lead to isolationism and plunge nations into clarify positions, advance agreements, and secure peace between peoples is recognized even in the sacred texts of the Christian faith, where language is intimately linked to national identities. We, we hear in Daniel 3, 4, for example, then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, you peoples, nations, and populations of all languages. Diplomatic and automatic uses of language. The diplomatic use of language today has developed to the point where it is serving as an instrument not of spiritual salvation, but of physical survival. The large scale application of multilingual communication at a global level at a con in conferences addressing existential challenges as has just occurred in the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the parties in Glasgow, attended by some 40,000 people from some 200 countries, serves to highlight that there are historical junctures at which only the totality of human intellectual resources, creatively unified by all cultures being duly represented, will prove equal to the task of ensuring our survival. The evolution of this style of multilateral relations has been over three centuries in the making and is now firmly established as the norm. Requiring practices that enable diplomats and spokespersons to express themselves in different languages. A noteworthy scientific American report drawing on recent research findings reminds us that, quote, the human capacity for language has played a critical role in the development of civilizations, the transmission of knowledge, and our ability to collectively shape our environments, unquote. And that enhanced intelligence does indeed exist, but is multilingual rather than artificial, quote. Because the same neural machinery can be used for both linguistic and non-linguistic tasks, multilingual experience can even affect performance in contexts that involve no language at all, unquote. Human thought and human language grow over time in capacity to perceive and process reality. Although the accelerating pace of historical change sometimes gives us the impression that we have fallen behind. At the same time, the emergence of synthetic computer coding languages in parallel with the varied forms that communication takes in intercourse between the world peoples, prompt us to look for common features and to ask the question, what is human language? Noam Chomsky describes language as, quote, audible thought, unquote, and observed that it is a, quote, species property, unquote. Does this mean that speech exists only when humans are using words? That would be an oversimplification concealing a larger reality. When I overhear the vocalizations of a lone songbird near my window, I am reminded that many living beings in our world articulate sound or song, even when they are, there are no other members of their species within earshot. Among members of our species, there are many mental or emotional states which do not lend themselves to formulation of communicable words. Fear, confusion, wonder, surprise, anger, shock, dismay, sorrow, lust, passion, pity, warning, admonition, reserve, resignation, awe, supplication, as well as certain human collective moods and customs, such as ritual solemnity. In those, in those situations, when words fail us, the utterances that we produce or silences we observe are as essential an aspect of language as the communicative functions we exercise when voicing a greeting, engaging in conversation, ordering dinner, giving a lecture, making a deal, or delivering a speech. In such circumstances, whether because we are dumbfounded by an overpowering emotion 
or because we have nothing cogent to say, it is the message, it is not the message's lack of importance that may make it less intelligible. Rather, the communicative function is giving way to the expressive in such a way that the deep structure is partly occluding and obscuring aspects of the surface structure. Further complicating this picture is the fact that the mindset or tone we call irony can give utterances meaning and intent different from and even opposite to what the words denote, depending on context. The fact that the nuance unspoken or unspoken or placed between the lines can be very important. And the fact that the silence can be heavily laden with meaning. Speech stemming from situations or moods articulable by surface structure can to some extent be mimicked or replicated, but those residing deep in, in deep structure cannot because they are unpredictable and therefore unprogrammable. Although they are not always entirely unforeseeable to an experienced human interpreter trained to sense motivations and anticipate speech patterns as they unfold. Diplomacy, truth or consequences. This dual nature of communication in which the emotive motivational dimension modulates the cognitive conceptual dimension as we externalize language through sensory motor means, it's especially relevant when language is used for the purpose of creating and maintaining relations between diverse human groups. This was observed to be so among several ancient cultures of which we have historical records. For example, as articulated by the ancient China at the beginning of the third century before the Christian era by Taoist philosopher Shuan Zhu. I quote, if relations between states are close, they may establish mutual trust through daily interaction. But if relations are distant, mutual confidence can only be established by exchanges of messages. Messages must be conveyed by messengers, diplomats. Their contents may either be pleasing to both sides or likely to engender anger between them. Faithfully conveying such messages is the most difficult task under the heavens. For if the words are such as to evoke a positive response on both sides, there will be the temptation to exaggerate them with flattery. And if they are unpleasant, there will be the tendency to make them even more biting. In either case, the truth will be lost. And if truth is lost, mutual trust will also be lost. If mutual trust is lost, the messenger himself may be imperiled. Therefore, I say to you that it is a wise rule always to speak the truth and never to embellish it. In this way, you will avoid much harm to yourselves." Close quote. That is from ancient China. However, speaking truth to power is not always easy. The delicate balance of emotions, tones expressed by inflection, sometimes accompanied by for emphasis or conveyed through gestures, is needed to correctly pitch and edit content in order to make successful use of diplomatic language. This reflects the principle formulated by Noam Chomsky that creative language use cannot be programmed into a computer, which is a non-sentient entity. Human communication is shaped by context, and context is strongly determinative of truth and accuracy. Moreover, in addition to perception of context, human discernment is needed to make the right judgment calls regarding register and completeness in interpreting. Even if computer-aided devices were available, to help process spoken contents faster, we could not allow textual volume or density, word choice, terminological distinctions, or phrase length to prevent us from fulfilling the central purpose of interpretation, 
which is to convey a particular message in a defined context from one person or group to another. Moreover, quality diplomatic interpreting strives to find the nearest natural equivalence, not only semantically, but also stylistically. In the same manner as quality literary translation, the interpreter must shun being so immersed in the source text, adhering so closely to the source language that the resulting prose is affected and awkward or even worse, unreadable. Over the centuries, empires have declined and the imperial power paradigm characterized by a central dominant power surrounded by smaller powers, a model conducive to monolingualism, has given way in both East and West to a more inclusive paradigm of globalization conducive to and dependent on multilingualism. For example, had the Roman emperor ever succeeded in establishing central control over all of the territories technically under his jurisdiction, the relations of the Western European states to it might have been similar to those of China's neighbors to the Middle Kingdom, with France comparable to Vietnam or Korea and Great Britain comparable to Japan. That is a quotation from Henry Kissinger's textbook on diplomacy. So we see that there is a parallel between the way diplomacy has evolved in both East and West. Under this form of globalization today, of political dominance and, and economic hegemony remain present in the world. But a higher degree of harmony is being pursued today that goes hand in hand with fuller support for the right to speak one's own language even in diplomatic meetings between nations, enabling speakers to achieve greater clarity and eloquence with fuller confidence of success in pursuit of their goals. Looking westward from the ancient Chinese form of diplomatic discourse mentioned earlier, it appears that as the distinctive roles of messengers developed through history, the first professional diplomats were those of Byzantium, with the use of diplomats as licensed spies and employment of information they gathered to devise skillful and subtle policies to compensate for lack of real power. That is a quote from the history of diplomacy in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So here we already see in its incipient historical form in Byzantium, what is today sometimes referred to as the, quote, warfare versus lawfare situation, an uneven world order in which less powerful nations of necessity rely more on persuasion, skill, subtlety, and eloquence because they lack resources or military power to impose their will. And while the strongest power of the day may often prevail on matters of policy, it has long been the case, even before the emergence of today's forms of conference diplomacy, that in contacts among sovereigns, all voices must be heard. I quote from the history of diplomacy of the Encyclopedia Britannica again. In one 25 year period of the fourth century BC, for example, there were eight Greco-Persian congresses where even the small states had the right to be heard. Close quote. In the Ottoman era, the functions of diplomat and interpreter were intimately combined in the position of dragoman, which made interlingual, interlingual communication an official function entrusted to specialists possessing both language skills and the knowledge of public affairs. British historian Patrick Balfour has vividly described this period. Above all, foreign diplomats had to contend with the problem of language, for no one knew, none knew, knew, no one, none knew Turkish 
and few Turks knew a European language. The foreign envoy thus depended upon his own dragoman, his interpreter, who was usually a Greek or a Levantine. I will skip the rest of the quote, which is quite lengthy, but which you will be able to find in the printed version of the presentation. Truth, error, and automaticity. In our era of digital re revolution, what impact will digitalization have on the activity of diplomats and interpreters? Machine translation, translation has been gradually improving, but the human brain, the most powerful of all computers, does the job much better and has been doing so for some 74 years, at least since the since simultaneous interpreting was introduced at Nuremberg. Because translators and interpreters often work in the midst of controversy, whether in the courtroom or in the conference room, there is a natural inclination to critique their work, largely in terms of accuracy. Critiques which may tend, which may lend credence to the idea that automating linguist tasks might be reducing error or eliminating bias, and that mechanized communication is more reliable and truthful because it is devoid of feelings. The opposite is true. Feelings are one of the things that can render an interpretation more genuine, more complete, and more worthy of attention than the flat and rock was not good for the human program. Moreover, an interpreter's skill in using his voice can be more accurate because when he is grasping can impart a great As one of their strategies, interpreters learn to memorize an automatic theme. Motivations, allocations, and their ambitions in order to conserve mental energy. But this is done to save time and focus attention on substance, not to cut corners. The automaticity is self imposed, acquired through training and experience that can be part of the mind at any time. The nuance being used by the speaker calls for creative language. This is variation of the words and the words. That's the original condition of the human language. Through use of metaphor, to extend the language of the word, for example. This differs from the automaticity of the computer, which functions as a whole of the mind, and may have been programmed in a way to translate a given lexical term. Interpreting, like translating, is a kind of writing. And writing is also a kind of language. Languages, the more the better. When diplomatic agents conveying messages to each other hail from countries that adhere to different customs and speak different languages, it is nevertheless expected that they will have the skill to make the messages they convey not only truthful, but also comprehensible, faithful, and complete. Out of a desire to ensure this integrity of the message, temptation may arise in the interest of economy or simplicity to resort instead to monolingual communication. But this may result in inequity and an impoverishment of thought because it does not take advantage of the cognitive assets of plurilingualism. In, in mixed and multilingual teams. Similarly, the temptation may arise to make use of such contrived solutions as an invented language like Esperanto or a uniform cipher like Morse code, a reductive approach recently reincarnated in the notion that computers being mathematically infallible are also more unbiased and efficient in that they could spare humans the pain of having to learn 
grammatical rules and vocabulary lists. A fallacy which I described on International Translation Day in 2005 as the cybernetic siren song. With communications technology advances now spanning vast distances and providing means for people to safely interact and work even in the midst of a pandemic, it is tempting to think that comparable technical means could also be used to break language barriers. But there is no beneficent MT genie in the CT magic lantern. Technology is one means by which we externalize thought, but it cannot itself generate or formulate the message, nor can it be held accountable when the cloud is used for surreptitiously advancing an objectionable idea, while its author is screened from public view through censorship or by cloaking, it, by cloaking the idea in electronic gadgetry, while the person actually harboring the motive for the act remains sheltered in a cloud of electronic anonymity or plausible deniability, which is yet another recent twist in the game of let the computer do it. Interpreters being only human are subject to various kinds of errors, such as lapsus lingue, slip of the tongue, or lapsus kalani, error of composition. With different degrees of seriousness, depending on the circumstances and the context. But the errors committed by automated machines are neither errors of form nor errors of substance. They are in effect mechanical breakdowns like a flat tire or a short circuited lamp. Whether such malfunctions turn out to be harmless, embarrassing, or merely absurd will again depend on circumstances and context. A machine translation error may be as inoffensive as a third grade school child's misspelling, or it may constitute an affront to personal dignity, such as might justify suing for defamation. A recent salient example is the recent MT inspired denigration of a, head of, of a head of government by comparing him to a mob boss. I quote, it was with great pleasure today that I welcomed my friend, Prime Minister of the Underworld, Mark Rutte, in Athens, close quote. Here, the talking machine is going haywire in three ways. First, by uncontextually translating an isolated word, a clumsy mishandling of language structure that professional linguists learn to avoid in their first year translation class. Second, by failing to recognize the name of a country, an error that any educated person would not commit if he reads the newspaper. A third, by mispresenting a formal title, a mistake that a translator would not make if he has taken the trouble to consult the official author. Such an error is committed by simultaneous interpreters struggling with a fast speech at a conference would be a stain on their reputation and might lead to a reprimand. If committed by machine, it merely triggers further cybernetic research and the launch of yet, the yet another version of the error-prone software in the hope of reaching that elusive degree of soulless clockwork perfection at which added complexity and redundancy no longer causes confusion or reveals ignorance. Language, which Chomsky describes as a living, evolving process that makes infinite use of, inf of finite means to generate an intelligible universe from an infinite store of thoughts, cannot be replicated by machine. MT embodies the misconception that a machine with no human operator at the controls can perform a task that is normally performed by a person. This fond idea has been around in fiction, at least as long as the tale of Aladdin's magic lamp. It is even present in the etymology of some common words, such as the Russian word samovar, which literally means self-heating, and designates a type of teapot popular in Russia that keeps the tea warm almost as reliably as if there were always someone there lighting the burner. But while the idea behind the word samovar 
may be fanciful or charming. Other analogous concepts, such as that of autonomous vehicles, that is, allowing the vehicle to drive themselves, are potentially far more dangerous. Automation can increase convenience, but caution is called for, not least because the time may come when humans will need appropriate applications of electronic data processing to secure their survival. And it is therefore critical to us to learn how to draw the line between what machines can and cannot do for us, and the discretion <laughs> to set rational limits. On the legal authority, we delegate to non-human instrumentalities. A parking meter can enforce parking regulations on a public thoroughfare, and an airport public address system can direct recorded instructions to travelers in a public uh, airport lobby but a computer cannot proffer a policy compromise to a foreign diplomat without risking a violation of the latter's sovereignty or immunity. It is wishful thinking to suppose that advanced machines can economically displace human judgment, that artificial intelligence will act as a cognitive dominator, bringing the most difficult tasks within the reach of the least intelligent users also incidentally, making such machines more widely marketable and profitable. Or that removing human intervention from an activity somehow guarantees objectivity. This problem will not be resolved through refinements in hardware design, software development, because the phenomenon being models only grows larger, such as for example, the quantifiable factors involved in climatic and demographic trends. While at the same time, increasing the capacity of computer programs makes them harder to control. Consequently, depending on the order of magnitude of the trends being, of the factors being quantified and modeled, there comes a point at which computerized data processing proves unable to supply solutions. Human thought and language, by contrast, is not subject to such limitations. I quote, every language, dialect, patois, or lingo is a structural, structurally complete framework into which can be poured any subtlety of emotion or thought that its users are capable of experiencing. Whatever it lacks at any given time or place in the way of vocabulary and syntax can be supplied in very short order by borrowing and imitation from other languages. Close quote. That is a quote from Einar Haugen. Thus allowing creative language, thus creative language used by humans, especially if it is multilingual, makes it possible to achieve more than what computerized data processing can achieve. It is also less prone to critical error, as illustrated by the case of the NASA spacecraft Mars Orbiter. The Mars Climate Orbiter has a 600 kilogram robotic space crew launched in 1998 to study the Martian climate, Martian atmosphere and surface changes. The spacecraft encountered Mars on the trajectory that brought it too close to the planet and was either destroyed in the atmosphere or escaped the planet's vicinity and entered an orbit around the sun. An investigation attributed, to the failure, attributed the failure to a measurement mismatch between two software systems. The measurement mismatch in question pertained to the version of metric and imperial units a problem that translators routinely encounter and are trained to identify instantly to resolve correctly. Commonalities and groups. Negotiating difficulty often arises from adversarial positions between two countries or from distances between them, 
in the global geopolitical arena that make it harder to bridge the communication gap. In these situations, the interpreter is serving to some degree as a mediator, since rendering a statement into another language itself inevitably puts the statement in a somewhat different light with the interpreter, which the interpreter should strive to ensure is consistent with the speaker's intent and conducive to resolution. Although bilateral treaties are still serving their purpose, diplomatic relations have become largely multi multilateral channeled in multiple languages through contacts in diverse forums, encompassing the region, encompassing far reaching global issues and broad areas of common ground. In conferences dealing with many areas of knowledge, trade, science, industry, or culture, diverse nations often adopt similar public positions and countries align themselves in categories according to geographical and economical realities, regional affinities, or shared negotiated postures. Countries may form coalitions based on similar interests, shared cultural and linguistic origins, similar circumstances, shared perspectives on common problems or strategic alliances. Even on vital national security interests and problems as daunting as global climate change or pandemics, consensus positions are often possible and the compromise solutions often temper sovereignty. The content of public, public statements made in debate at global conferences cut across cultural, political, geographical, linguistic lines. And deliberations focused on the existential threat of climate change have revealed a vast area of common ground, which by its urgency eclipses many individual differences in national negotiating postures, since failure to address existential threats could imply futility issues and efforts. The interpreter's role differs significantly when interpreting in a bilingual setting, be it in a bilateral encounter or in disputes, or when interpreting into two target languages. In a one-on-one -on -one conversation, parties may be sharing the same stage but pursuing divergent aims that shape the public posture of the adoption and their expectation of how interpreters should perform. The interpreter is occupationally vulnerable to counter pressures from his two clients. No matter what he does, one party is apt to be displeased. Accordingly, in many bilateral encounters, each party provides its own interpreter, placing each interpreter in a somewhat ambivalent position, reducing all strength at the same time. Identifying what the principle look who's talking. When making a speech or argument to an international audience, speakers customarily address the chairperson or presiding officer of the conference invoking general principles that set the scene and strengthen the argument. And the speech generally embodies a point of view that is in some measure regional or global. For the interpreter, giving a convincing rendition of this type of speech means adopting an impartial attitude, while also knowing how to identify with the principle and not to echo his sentiments and make the interpretation performance effective in terms of advocacy. Interpretation may be correct and incorrect, but among a more complex dispersion of alternatives. Close quote from Susan Sontag. That concludes my presentation. I invite you to find the text of the presentation in the uh, proceedings of the conference. 
and to consult and read the footnotes that accompany it, which contain much more information than I was able to speak out in this recording. Thank you very much and many thanks to the University of Algeria for their assistance and for having the idea of convening this very interesting conference. Goodbye. إذا أشكر الأستاذ جيمس نولن على المداخلة القيمة التي قدمها للأسف مثل ما قلت وذكرته في البداية فإن الصوت لم يكن يعني جيدا من التسجيل من المصدر الآن سأدعو الأستاذ حمود صالحي ليلتحق بنا إلى اللجنة هل تسمعني أستاذ حمود صالحي؟ أرسلكم صوتي نعم نسمعك نعم جيدا سمي. أهلا أستاذ أهلا وسهلا ومرحبا شكرا جزيلا نتمنى أن تكون بخير آه الحمد لله آه شكرا على الدعوة هل أبدأ في المحاضرة مباشرة أم نعم يمكنك أن تبدأ في المحاضرة يمكنني أن أقدمك أيضا أم أنك ستقدم نفسك يمكن أن تتولى التقديم وبعد ذلك أبدأ في المحاضرة إن شاء الله تمام إذا الأستاذ الدكتور حمودة صالحي درس الترجمة ولديه ماستر في اللسانيات ودكتوراه في الدراسات الترجمية وهو مؤسس مشروع الترجمان الترجمان بروجكت وهذا المشروع يعني يعنى بتدريب الترجمة وأيضا بالبحث وهو أيضا مشرف على برنامج الماستر للترجمة والترجمة الشفوية في جامعة تونس المنار فأستاذ أقدم إليك الكلمة وسوف أنشر مداخلتك بعد ثوان شكرا جزيلا ربما ادعو زميلتي المترجمه صفاء المسعودي وهي ستساعدني في العرض هذا تمام فاذا كانت طبعا ساضيفها تعرف متى يكون العرض ومتى شكرا نعم. جزيلا ساضيفها اذا السلام عليكم عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهل الجزائر الحبيبة وأهل الأرض الآخرين الحاضرين معنا السيدة الدكتورة عديلة بن عودة الدكتورة إلهام بزاوشة الدكتورة إيمان محمودي والدكتورة صابرين رميلة والدكتور فوزي بالعالية أشكركم جزيلا شكرا موصولا وقد أسعدني على الدعوة لطيفة وقد فعلا أسعدني قبولها قبولا حسنا ويشرفني الآن إلقاء هذه المحاضرة تشريفا أولا أرجو أن الصوت يصل وصولا حسنا على الرغم من أننا يعني هناك بعض الـ 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 بعض المشكلات الفنية هذا الصباح وهذا مفهوم لأننا نلتقي بالتحاضر بطريقة التحاضر المرئي وكنا نود أن يكون اللقاء لقاء حضوريا وجاهيا فأولا أريد أن أتأكد من أن الصوت يصل جيدا مئة في المئة صوت واضح شكرا. إليك الكلمة تفضل شكرا جزيلا So I'm going to switch into English now. Thank you very much, uh, and, and good morning to you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends. Uh, again, I wish to thank the Institute of Translation at the University of uh, Algiers too, and the organizing committee for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the uh, opportunity to talk about 
about my experience with interpreting uh, and translation, both as a researcher, but most importantly, as a practitioner, as a professional uh, interpreter and professional translator. I also wish to extend my thanks to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, for attending this talk, either directly on this uh, platform or through the live stream. And I am aware that there is a live stream. And I wish to invite you all to uh, share your thoughts, knowledge, and expertise uh, in this subject. I invite you to uh, take part in the discussion later on, perhaps, and in the, in, on, on the chat box, to uh, take part actively by reporting on your own experiences with regard to the arguments and the uh, examples I'm going to put forward and discuss here. I would like to also to learn from your own experiences uh, uh, the, and to learn from your diverse backgrounds, languages and experiences because some of the examples or some of the arguments I'm going to uh, investigate might be controversial to some extent. Uh, you know, the, 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 the topic or, or, or the subject of this conference and the subject of my talk and the talk of my uh, predecessors, the guest speakers, uh, is uh, really very important. I, I would like to hide that importance, uh, the, the subject of language, translation, uh, uh, culture, diplomacy, and, 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 and because uh, th th these are now being studied on the shifting ground of world politics uh, and across a, an ever-changing landscape of international relations between states, states of peace, coup d'etat, uh, wars, civil wars, uh, pandemics, revolutions, and so on and so forth. So the subject of my talk uh, is about an area at the crossroads of, as I said, language, uh, linguistics, pragmatics, culture, translation, and interpreting. I'm going to talk to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are, or even evening. Uh, about interpreting as cross-cultural diplomacy. And here my uh, definition of diplomacy is not the conventional uh, concept of uh, and uh, conceptualization of diplomacy because diplomacy, uh, diplomacy's meaning and concept is Oh, it looks like we lost Dr. Hamouda. هل أنت معنا؟ أستاذ حمودة صالحي. أعتقد بأنه فقد. تواصل بالإنترنت الأستاذة صفاء هل يمكنك أن تفعل الميكروفون وتلتحق بنا أستاذ فوزي سامعني؟ نعم أسمعك جيدا صباح النور يبدو أن السيد حمودة فقد الاتصال أنا أقترح أن ننتظر نعم. بعض دقائق فقط حتى يلتحق ثم نواصل العرض لا مشكلة سنحاول الانتظار قليلا طيب شكرا شكرا لك
لا بأس قد نفتح ربما نقاشا ونطرح أسئلة ربما على المداخلات الماضية هل لديك أسئلة هل لديك أسئلة لنطرحها إلى سيسيليا ربما وهي متواجدة معنا نعم زميلي فوزي هناك أسئلة للأستاذة سيسيليا هل هل أنت في الاستماع فيلي؟ نعم نعم أسمعك سيسيليا نعم. إذا هناك Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. She said the interpretation is coming on and off, so I'm, I'm a bit lost with ah. what's happening. So, but if you talk to me in English or Spanish, I'll be okay, happy I will. to I will. To answer questions. I have a few yeah. questions that I noticed from the chat, which I'm happy to answer Great. whenever you so say. So about the questions you have noted, you can start answering them, and then we will uh, see with other comments or additions. Of course. So um, I spotted two questions. One uh, related to the pandemic and how we continue to work during the pandemic and the other one uh, related to uh, who will be teaching and uh, training students as diplomatic interpreters. So let's do the second question first, if that's okay with you. Yes, yes. Um, in an ideal world, or in an ideal situation, I think that this um, should be addressed with a combination of experts in each of the fields. So it, it could be Um, this is purely my imagination and what I envision I would like to see happening. So we'd like to see a specialist master's program as a specialization for diplomatic interpreting. So we, could, we would have uh, interpreters trainers that on top of teaching simultaneous um, interpretation skills, they would teach note-taking, which should be added to the curricula, which is not. Um, my training back in Argentina was a little bit traditional. So we started with site translation, note taking, and then simultaneous. So that could be a good approach. And then um, we would need perhaps guest lecturers if you want to have an overview of all the different supplementary skills. Um, it could be even um, teachers of those skills. So there are many people who are teaching protocol or they are teaching um, cross-cultural communication or intercultural um, studies. And I think that we should, the interpreters, at least you should have a panel of, or, or a um, advisory group of practicing diplomatic interpreters who could guide those experts in, and say, this is what interpreters need. The clearest example would be protocol. So we don't need to learn how to set the table we need other aspects of protocol because those are the ones that we use when we are interpreting. So we could sort of walk them through this and then put together a program. Uh, then uh, pandemic. So for the pandemic, uh, the pandemic was quite a challenge. And uh, traditionally, especially for me here in the UK, mid-February till the end of March is usually my busiest time with delegations. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had six weeks of back-to-back -back delegations canceled over 48 hours. So you can imagine uh, how terrifying that was. However, we could slowly transition into online. So over the last 18 months, um, many of my clients transitioned into running online forums, online webinars, Uh, some had, we had a few hybrid experiences, especially in the last, during the spring, so in the last three or four, three months, so, so not four months, three months. Uh, and it was, a, 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 you need, I, I needed to understand very well how the online environment works, especially for multilingual settings. And um, fortunately, I had experience, I had been volunteering for remote interpreting for the last three or four years with different organizations because I knew it was an added value. At the time, I saw it as an added value to continue working with visiting delegations once they left the UK because I was already involved in their project. But then it came in very handy because I could advise them and give them ideas of how they could create virtual experiences. So you had to be very proactive. But we need to, and that's something 
another difference with confidence in temperature because it's so hands-on and you need to be able to decide what's the best way to assist your client. You need to understand the technology. Those are tools, microphones, uh, computers, tour guides, and those are tools. So at least you need to know how they work so you can advise which one to use and then have the you know technical stuff to support you. I see there are more, more questions coming in. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, let me see if I can scroll back or you can help me as well if you wish. Yes. So quickly, there is uh, this teacher with us, uh, Dr. Uh, Hamisi, who mm -hmm. is an interpreter. Um, he's asking about the uh, sp specialty uh, when we um, dedicate a diplomatic uh, interpreting inside our universities and uh, translation inst institutes. Who will train the interpreters? Who is um, the person who will try to train them? So should they be interpreters of diplomatic background or general? interpreters or what, what it do you depends think? of what you are training i don't don't know exactly how the setup for your university is but you would have in, an interpreting tutor that could be a general mm -hmm. interpreter because you are teaching interpreting skills the problem with interpreting skills these days is that at least in europe all the um masters the European Masters of Conference interpreting usually have little to no note-taking consecutive training. They are changing it. So if if you have interpreter, interpreter trainers who can teach consecutive, those could be, you know, because you're teaching interpreting skills. So you need to, uh, I think that what happened was, um, and I'm, this also uh, discloses my age. I'm older, so I came from an old school of uh, teaching, and it was simplified. And now it's only focused on simultaneous. Whereas in the past yeah. we used to learn note taking, and and now it's not the case. So maybe we need to, you know, re bring it back in 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 a sense. And the same as retour depends on each country. Spain traditionally. It's only unidirectional training. So it's only uh, a single language booth. And now they are ramping up retour training because diplomatic is constantly bidirectional. You don't have an English uh, booth or somebody working with you. So now they are bringing back, or they are actually in Spain for the first time, bringing retour training, which you also need. So for interpreting skills, I would say general interpreters could do the training and then for specific skills uh, there should be somebody who's versed in those skills and I think that there should be uh, practicing diplomatic interpreters who are fortunately either they are interpreting and or they're teaching so but they could be really good um, supporters or advisors when putting together the curricula. Thank you so much for your uh, answer. Uh, there is another Another question about, mm -hmm. well, this one is more about um, uh, the work field and when you, uh, when you were um, a diplomatic interpreter, um, were there situations where you weren't able to understand a certain term or a phrase by a diplomat? By a diplomat? Yes. Or let's say in a situation of a high uh, diplomacy uh, uh, level. So what is the um, behavior of an interpreter? So, uh, yes, there's always something that you don't understand. And I'm sure that um, all translation teachers are going to start noting now when I say context is everything. And uh, uh, so context helps a lot. I think that the best thing that would help you is um, remain calm, um, be well rested, one of the best pieces of advice I got was before my first translation test back in translation school where when our teacher told us, don't study the night before, go to bed early. And if you can, like go to the movies or to the hairdresser or whatever relaxes you, because what do you need is your wits. So you, we know a lot more than we think we do. So if you don't understand something, you can uh, get context to help you. And depending on the situation, maybe you can ask or you can ask for repetition. 
sometimes it's not possible. Uh, if you don't want to ask for repetition because you don't understand the term, um, I never say I don't understand the term. I'd rather say I couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. face saving the interpreter as well and the same is when somebody is speaking very very fast if you ask somebody to slow down the person if it's a nice person is going to slow down but they will forget 30 seconds later they will forget and they will go back to their natural pace however if you tell them you can't hear them they will speak louder and when they go loud they speak slowly that's Slowly. a natural reflex. And it's out of their own interest to be heard. So mm -hmm. it's their interest to be heard, not their interest to help me. So that's so you, you need to be resourceful. But then it's experience. And and, exactly. and and that really, really counts. So if you are just starting, whenever it's possible, start with a senior interpreter next to you. You may not be invited to the super high level things, but you won't be able to handle them anyway. So start the lowest ranks, the lowest levels, and get a senior interpreter next to you. I think that's a lot better than just volunteering on your own or not having somebody to give you feedback and to be able to see you at work or you can see them at work and learn. Well, uh, great. Thank you so much for- You're welcome. Uh, uh, the answer, I think it answers also the uh, next question about stress and pressure and how to handle it. Maybe also a good night's sleep uh, helps a lot. Better yeah, than you can't always get it. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't always get it. Sometimes you're just flying and you just land and you jump in. But uh, that's what I meant when you have to to know yourself. And And sometimes, yes, I mean, I think interpreters we can manage stress. And, and I know that some authors and some experts have compared the pressure of our work to air traffic uh, controllers. And, but you need to know when you need a moment to slow down, maybe you go to, you know, excuse yourself, you go to outside the room or you go to the toilet sometimes and you just catch your breath and then you come back. But yes, that, that is part of the package. It's part of the excitement as well. Well, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, is there an organizing body for the diplomatic interpreters in the UK, like a national register? No. What, what type of... There's no, no, or no professional body of any sort in any part of the world, as far as I know. And the way that in diplomatic interpreters work, I mean, this is the, the commercial point of view. So how do you get into diplomatic interpreting? I'm sure that's not the question that people are asking. You're very nice. Because <laughs> usually I get, where do I get clients? That's the first question. Well, yeah. it depends on each country. So each country has their own regulations. There are countries who only have a staff interpreter at presidential level, and everything else is contracted with freelancers or the trusted team of freelancers. There are countries where they have entire teams that are employees of, let's say, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and they do translation and they do interpreting. There are countries where there's nothing, and it's just a free private market for everyone. So it depends on where you are and what your languages are. And also it depends on what you yeah. want to do. I mean, I moved from Buenos Aires to London to do this. You know, there's no bunch diplomacy going on in Buenos Aires, at least not as much as in London. So you need to find out wherever you are, how it works and how you access it. Well, uh, thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you uh, My very pleasure. much. And uh, uh, Sir Hamoud Asal is here with us now. Uh, we lost you for a few moments, but uh, Cecilia saved us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I could hear you. I was to get... <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It is really, uh, I, I'm really very sorry. Uh, this happens okay. and uh, these are the disadvantages of working online. There are so many other advantages, but still uh, we are uh, at the mercy of the internet and the technology. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, I'm wondering what was the last uh, idea you've heard from me? <laughs> I will, I will, I will show turn you my the camera slides. off on my microphone so I'll let you know. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you, Cecilia. For... 
the answers. So uh, I will show you the, um, yeah. So exactly, so the, the structure uh, of my talk. Yeah, you have yeah. the floor back. Thank you very much. So um, uh, it is, um, so this is the uh, st structure of my talk, uh, speaking uh, about uh, uh, the 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 uh, way how interpreters are acting as diplomats, interpreters as cultural clarifiers, uh, interpreters as messengers of peace, interpreters as negotiators in business deals. Uh, but sometimes interpreters are being called to testify, compelled to testify, and here. Uh, there is a very famous case I'm going to report on it later on. And the second chapter would be uh, about the visibility and invisibility and powerfulness and powerlessness of interpreters uh, and about the judicious intervention that interpreters sometimes are allowed to uh, to intervene in the in the meaning and add uh, a spin of their own culture. So this is above language level, but the stakes are also taking place at language level because language is tricky, uh, and the interpreter is required to have and acquire a skill of adaptation, and more particularly. A magic to bring about a magic remedy and I will finish this presentation by a message interpreting in conclusion but before that I would like to invite you ladies and gentlemen to try your hands at these expressions and utterances which have been extracted from real conferences real life conferences and texts First, I'll think about it. Second, Your Excellency or Your Excellencies. Third, with a push and a shove. Four, great power competition. Five, the Mujahideen of the Islamic State. Six, the world's most powerful men. And seven, an Nakba. Eight, a sheikh. Nine, uh, imprisoning women for defying the wishes of men. Ten, what refugees face on their treacherous journey. Eleven, irda'an lil milishiyati wa khidmatan li ahdafi Erdogan. Twelve, refugees risked everything to make this treacherous journey. Thirteen, Supreme Court has struck down the death sentence for blasphemy. 14. Comfort women. 15. Maximum security prison. 16. At al idiaat. 17. Strange political mouthings, lies, and fabrications. 18. Had the blood of the Palestinians killed in Sheikh Jarrah. And uh, and 19. Erez crossing. 20. Resolution. So, interpreters as diplomats. Modern diplomacy is currently experiencing fundamental changes on an unprecedented rate. Diplomacy does not pertain to diplomats only. It also pertains to judicial, security, military, religious leaders, and other community leaders and officials as well. Interpreting in diplomatic settings is often complex in that it involves a wide range of linguistic, pragmatic, discursive, cultural, psychological, uh, and, and other protocol elements and factors that make communication possible. And here I'm really very happy to speak about Cecilia and James because they laid the foundation for me uh, to speak about other things because they have covered uh, uh, most of the elements uh, and factors required and the conditions working in diplomatic settings. 
So the interpreters who are invisible most of the time in a dimly lit uh, booth, in most cases, they, they, they actively participate in turbulent peace talks, transitional justice reforms, and public hearings of victims uh, of violations of human rights, for example, and actively participate in war crime trials like the Nuremberg trials, or in somewhat calmer trade negotiations and in all other kinds of uh, international meetings. Their presence is crucial at important gatherings uh, of diplomats who are attempting to settle international disputes or to mediate uh, some uh, uh, problems and difficulties, especially in contexts now in the Arab world that is uh, facing uh, enormous challenges, mediation in Libya, mediation in Sudan, mediation uh, in uh, Yemen, in Syria, and so on, and, and even in Tunisia. So in their own way, through a language skill, through an intercultural competence, interpreters contribute to world harmony. Interpreters in diplomacy can uh, prove very rewarding, as interpreters feel that they uh, are giving their small, sometimes tiny, contribution to history in the making. Uh, but sometimes you do not act or you are called not to act only as an interpreter, as a human being, as a part of an exchange or a communication. You are a human being. And interpreters, despite the fact that this is controversial and uh, most of the codes of ethics, they uh, perhaps warn some interpreters not to go the extra mile and act as a, a cultural advisor and stick to what has been said, but sometimes to stick to what has been said might, uh, might not serve the communication ends. And here is one example. There is a, a story that is uh, in the literature about President Nixon of the United States of America who received and welcomed Emperor Hirohito. And during personal negotiations, President Nixon asked Emperor Hirohito one question, and the emperor at one point responded to a, th this question by saying, I will think about it. I will think about it. And the interpreter translated it literally. I will think about it. But the interpreter in this case should have made it very clear to Mr. Nixon that this answer uh, translated as no, knowing the Japanese culture. Since this was not done, the result was a misunderstanding as what was not serving communication, as I said, and produced some resentment later on. Japanese people, like Oriental people in general, and including Arab people, they really find it very offensive to say no. Arab people might say, inshallah. Inshallah, and here we keep on, in Tunisia, in the Tunisian context, we keep on joking about the word inshallah because it has at least 20 meanings depending on the intonation when you say inshallah means no or inshallah yes i confirm and so on and so forth and here i have a testimony i have conducted a research a while ago and interviewed some officials and i would like also to come closer to the speakers and the officials to uh, have fresh insights into their perspective of communication. This is really very helpful for the interpreter, whether uh, the interpreter has to measure uh, it before getting into 
that uh, or acquiring that freedom or that 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 power it has to be granted that power first uh, so uh, interpreters can act as cultural clarifiers uh, interpreting has long been regarded as cultural assimilation and here i would like to invite uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Belaiba, to uh, display the first audio testimony, the role of the interpreter as a cultural advisor, the example of the bread. The example of the bread here, if you do uh, not intervene as an interpreter, I... uh, we were involved in an yes, exercise. Please go, the... please go ahead, yes. In an exercise in the police camp. Uh, and we were trying to encourage the students to, to chase us uh, as we were playing the role of, of being riders. I saw what I assumed was a, a, a stale piece of bread sitting on a wall. I picked it up and I threw it at the shields of the, the police officers to try and encourage them to chase me. And the whole event just stopped. And I could hear a lot of the language coming that I knew I'd done something wrong. Uh, and I realised then through the interpreter that you know this was a cultural issue uh, in Tunisia and any pieces of bread are left for small animals to try and encourage them that and it's a blessing if you do help feed these animals so through the interpreter again I apologize to the guys uh, I was unaware of this uh, and these things can happen and without the interpreter there to smooth the waters for me again well then it'd be hard for me to interact with the students يبدو أننا فقدنا الأستاذ صالحي مرة أخرى أظن أن لديه مشاكل في الاتصال بالإنترنت هل تؤكدين لنا أستاذ صالحي؟ نعم نعم صحيح يعني لا أظن أننا فقدنا الأستاذ شخصيا لكن سمعوا أظن هناك مشاكل في الإنترنت ربما سيد فوزي هل تسمعوني؟ نعم نعم أنه فقد الاتصال مرة أخرى وهو يحاول الالتحاق بنا مجددا الآن تمام تمام شكرا. ننتظره قليلا لقد عاد سيد حمودة مجددا أهلا وسهلا من جديد Sorry again أهلا بك أستاذ أهلا وسهلا هل الصوت يصلكم؟ نعم نعم أعتذر من جديد نعم نعم لا شكرا. مشكلة لا مشكلة هذا شكرا. يحدث كثيرا بشكل نعم. عادي so, so this is the role of the interpreter as a cultural clarifier, as a cultural advisor. So I would like to invite you also to play the other audio testimony, the example of Mohammed. Please. Okay, I, I will. Thank One you. second. Tunisia about culture and cultural differences and if you may um, just uh, show the role that 
an interpreter, for example, has play, played here in Tunisia? Uh, I know certainly I am. When we first come to the country, um, I was responsible for uh, training the trainers uh, with regards to adult education. And one of the things I was trying to convey to them was how to use a case study. Uh, now, one of the examples I gave, because I wanted to keep it local, was that I used the expression, Mohammed steals a car. And I said to the interpreter, this is the expression I'm going to use about case studies. And he stopped me and said, no, uh, change the name from Mohammed, because there are people in the classroom who might find it very offensive that you're using the name Mohammed. Uh, now, for me, it's a common name. Uh, I would not have seen the fact that that could potentially cause offence. So, had I not been corrected at that very early stage, it could have meant that we could have got off on the wrong foot with our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, here again is another example of um, this judicial intervention by the interpreter. Can you hear me well now? Hello? Yes, we do. Yes, yes we thank do. you. So interpreters also can act as messengers of peace in this age of... Uh, but I think you cannot see me, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, I, I don't know how to turn off. on my camera. So, uh, yes, uh, in the age of poaching liquidity, enforced migration, and overwhelming globality, in the age of uh, bitter armed conflicts and worldwide pandemics, forms of struggle and mov movements of resistance, um, mediation negotiations, and hence expressions have started to slough off their very local nature and started to, to be transferred uh, or uh, to, to uh, and, and, and mediators started to transfer uh, these uh, excessively culture bound skin across the bridge of translation and interpreting by old mediators, old mediators, namely diplomatic translators and uh, interpreters through language, intercultural competence again, and other skills certainly. Translators and interpreters have acted over history as messengers of peace, exactly like diplomats, facilitating negotiations and inclusion through the transfer of uh, those local needs and cultural experiences and expressions over the bridge of understanding, acculturation and cooperation. Last summer, I gave a talk on uh, interpreters and uh, judges in judicial cooperation, the search for common ground, and I invite you to watch it later on. So interpreters are also crucial in commercial negotiations. And here I would like to invite uh, Dr. Fauzi or Safa to share the last video. Thank you very much. Yes. You can, have, you can have the best project in the world, but if you don't have the best interpreter in the world, you won't be able to sell your product. The other evidence that interpreters can act as diplomats is the perception of interpreters by others, by the participants in a communication. And here the evidence is that sometimes they are called to testify. You all know and aware of the very famous case of the US Congress Democrats. Democrats are the US Congress who compelled the Russian interpreter to testify. That took place in 2018. There was an attempt by the Democrats in the US Con Congress to subpoena the State Department's in Russian interpreter who worked in close uh, door meetings between President Trump and uh, President Putin. They hoped to obtain some undisclosed content of what was discussed uh, 
through uh, her testimony and notes. So, uh, although this never materialized, but still this raises a very uh, good question about the role of interpreters uh, and uh, the discussion of uh, the codes of ethics. Again here, the AIC stood firm against uh, the interpreters being brought or compelled to testify. Now I move on to the uh, question of invisibility and the power uh, or visibility and the power that can be granted to interpreters. Top-ranking interpreters are well aware of their own worth. Oftentimes, they venture liberties. Uh, they grant themselves liberties uh, that lesser experienced interpreters uh, would not dare. Uh, here there is a story uh, of an English language interpreter who was interpreting for Adolf Hitler and other world leaders. So whenever anyone at the conference uh, became excited and uh, talked too fast, this interpreter did not hesitate to intervene and uh, restore order uh, in a way by reminding the participants and the world leaders that he could not process uh, a certain limit of, of words. So in by the way, that room uh, where the uh, proceedings took place was called uh, the uh, by one of the um, participants, uh, uh, the uh, schoolmaster, uh, the, the schoolroom, uh, uh, because uh, the interpreter who was at that time Dr. Um, Paul Schmidt was described as a schoolmaster, bringing his people to order and curb uh, unruly peoples. So high level and experienced interpreters exert a certain power uh, in, the, in, the, in the practicing of their, of their profession. And here, judicial intervention is required uh, in the profession, such as the example of, I will think about it. Although their skill uh, are linguistic and intercultural uh, to a large extent, uh, and, and that their main role is to facilitate communication, interpreters are far more than simple carriers of meaning and relayers of speech. This power stems from the considerable credibility enjoyed by the competent, reputable, neutral, and impartial interpreters. But again, I'm going to discuss this at world, uh, at, at, at language level. Uh, here, language is really tricky. And this requires the skill of adaptation and the magic remedy to be brought by the interpreter. Uh, may I ask Safa to please stop sharing the screen because I would like to be in interaction with the participants. Despite the fact that language is tricky, it offers magic remedies for its users. And interpreters are uh, some of the users. Uh, take the following examples. When I say, on va être en retard, how to translate that to an English speaker in a diplomatic setting? With some judicial, judicious intervention, I can translate it as, we are going to be a little late. So I add little, a little late. Or a Tunisian official stating, sometimes directly, I might translate it also in this particular context, uh, that might not work this way, that might, and I add the might. So here, these are required also to smooth the waters and not to be very sometimes offensive. Languages are also based on universal on a universal human experience that is offering many common denominators between their respective cultures interpreters and translators can still look for and rely on 
those commonalities. Let's take just one example, like uh, remedy, for example. I found out that many proverbs coming from different languages and cultures and different experiences, uh, they share the same message, sharing the same message. And here there is a slide about remedy. Can here, I would like, uh, can you please share the slide, Safa, please? Yes. Uh, here, some remedies are worse than the disease, a Roman proverb. For extreme ills, extreme remedies, Italian proverb. Cauterization is the last remedy. An Arabic proverb, as you know, آخر الطب الكي. وهو يضرب به هذا المثل يضرب في آخر ما يعالج به بعد اليأس. For if there is no remedy, why worry? A Spanish proverb. Five, adapt the remedy to the disease, Chinese proverb. And four, great evils, strong remedies, a Dutch proverb. Thank you. The language, the, the intervention of the interpreter and translator is language-based and culture-driven. And it is uh, it is in a way conducting some sort of diplomacy and mediation. I'm going to investigate this topic by the discussion of the translation and interpreting of utterances extracted, as I said, from real life conferences and texts. Let me start by the translation of honorary titles. Honorary titles are really complex and Arabic is rich in modes of address. Honorary titles differ greatly across the social, religious, the political hierarchies. Take the example of Your Excellency. How would you translate it? If you have an ambassador, you'd say Sa'adat as safir If there are excellencies, for example, I may rush in simultaneous interpreting Ashab al-Fakhama wal-Ma'ali wal-Sa'ada wa hakada. A title used to refer to high-ranking officials. Now, diplomats are, we, 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 we address diplomats uh, with Her Excellency or His Excellency, Presidents of re Republics, most ambas ambassadors, high commissioners, permanent representatives, and so on. In the judiciary, we tend to use honorable, honorable judge, or sometimes Your Excellency, uh, or Your Honor in Australia. In, it is really fascinating to know that, for example, in Jordan, um, judges are addressed So here we adapt the form of address to the context. The monarchies, Your Majesty, Royal Highness, uh, in case of Al Amir in Arabic is Jalalat Al Malik, Sumu Al Amir, uh, Amir Al Mu'minin Fi Sabak, uh, and even in, now in Morocco. Uh, so religious, His Holiness, the Pope, Qadaset Al Baba, wa hakada. And the Grand Ayatollah, uh, Ayatollah Al Khomeini. Now I'm going to discuss some examples from real conferences and texts with a Portshender Ashav. So here describing what happened in Sudan recently, whether it is a coup d'etat or not. A putsch is not a coup d'etat uh, and the armies taking over. The armies taking over um, in, in, in Sudan. Uh, Jihad, jihadism and great power competition are behind the rising coups. Here I would like to uh, investigate the word competition. And here there is some sort of culture here that we need to discuss. A putsch is now that is different from a coup in the sense that a coup is quicker and highly successful act. But a coup might be an attempted coup. Uh, a putsch, sorry, is an attempted coup. Uh, 
and that's why it is sometimes uh, and it is not finished coup as 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 you have uh, uh, witnessed and followed the the, the news that's why uh, the interpreter or the translator did not translate it as uh, but what is meant here is the monopoly of power by the army in Sudan and in other African uh, states. So here, in the sense of the rebel, تمرد الجيش على السلطة المدنية تمرد السلطة العسكرية على السلطة المدنية وأتينا بها سجعا التمرد والتفرد والتفرد بشاف to push وتتفرد بالسلطة because this might be the title the army's takeover in Sudan highlights a worrying trend تسلط الجيش على السودان يرسخ نزعة المفزعة jihadism and great power competition competition تنافس القوة العظمى I would say تنافس in Arabic would not mean that because التنافس هو أساسا في الخير this is culturally speaking التراغب في الخير so it is for the good it is a competition for the good in Arabic unlike English that's why we opted for tadahur al-quwa al-uzma wa huwa tadahur ghayr mu'lan ahyana wa tanafus fihi tadahur ala al-duwal al-afriqiyya min al-sin wa al-wilayat al-muttahida al-amerikiyya China, Russia, United States and the European Union and so on so here this is the first uh, another example the other example in May the last border uh, outpost between Syria and Iraq still controlled by the regime and President Bashar al-Assad fell to the Mujahideen of the Islamic State Mujahideen in English so the original text is in English here one of the interpreters translated it as Mujahideen of the Islamic here Mujahidu, Mujahidun al-Filistiniyun this is also positive so I think we can uh, uh, introduce some judicial, judicious intervention and translate it by jihadiyin akthar, more pejorative. Uh, let's move on. The world's most powerful man. World al-alam in Arabic, but here we can interpret it as al-ard. Aqwa rajulin ala wajhi al-ard la naqool wajh al-alam aw fi al-alam wajh al-ard afdal. Al-nakba Nakba might be translated as calamity, disaster, um, catastrophe, but also can be translated as a Nakba if it refers to a, an incident in history with the Palestinians. So we keep it because it marks some incident uh, in the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Here, uh, a sheikh depending on the context and the the diplomatic context in particular might be uh, religious uh, title uh, Sheikh Al-Azhar the Sheikh and it remains here Sheikh Al-Azhar uh, or Sheikh Al-Islam for example Ibn Taymiyyah uh, uh, and this is the name on the fuqaha uh, fuqaha and uh, al-ilm so here we translate it as a scholar of Islam scholar of Islam. When I say Sumu Sheikh, like in Kuwait, for example, uh, so his, uh, his Highness, His Highness or His Majesty, sometimes His Highness Sheikh Sabah Al-Ahmed uh, Subah, for example. Uh, now, let's move on now. Or sometimes the plural Sheikh of Mashaykh, and when it is plural of Mashaykh, this is the religious. So these are the scholars. Scholars and the Imams, we can translate them as Imams, Imams of Zaytuna, Mashaykh Zaytuna. And uh, here, depending on the context and the uh, whether it is religious, political, and uh, um, general, we can translate. Um, another text or conference, Jordan urged to stop imprisoning women for defying the wishes of men. And here I would like to focus on defying the wishes of men. منظمة العفو الدولية تحث الأردن على التوقف عن حبس النساء and here we opted for عصينا 
الرجال او عصينا بعولتهن البعوله so men can be translated as بعولتهن this is culturally we can uh, make the adaptation to the um, uh, arabic culture and here by the way this is a back translation when you state it in english uh, Again, دعت منظمة العفو الدولية الأردنية لإلغاء العمل بنظام الوصاية الذكورية التي تراه deemed inappropriate تراه نظاما مهينا أو جائرا إذا ما أقدمت المرأة على عصيان أمر الرجل أو بعلها عصيان أمر هنا إذا ما بنت علاقة رآها الرجل غير لائقة inappropriate it is really very problematic to translate inappropriate language indecent language indecent etc uh, because uh, it is loaded with cultural weight and I'm not going to discuss here الوصاية الولي والقيم والوكيل and so on this is especially in legal culture this is really rich discussion and I have Uh, made that discussion with my students. Now, another example. What refugees face on their treacherous uh, uh, Can you hear me quite well now? Just just a check. Yes, we do. We hear you very well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so here, what refugees face on their treacherous journey? Here the interpreter can have recourse to a technique called explicitation to make something implicit explicit, which it's implicitly uh, expressed in English. What refugees face means الأهوال أهوال الرحلة نترجمها أي أهوال تنتظر اللاجئين في رحلتهم المحفوفة بالمخاطر مثلا. وهكذا. Uh, another example. حكومة السراج تزج بنفسها في صراع دولي إرضاء للميليشيات وخدمة لأهداف إردوغان. The Sarraj government is now sinking or plunging itself ever deeper into an international conflict to the satisfaction. To the satisfaction. من السهل المنتنع هذا. Of militia groups and in the service of Erdogan's أهداف هنا أجندة. بمعنى الأجندة. Interpreted as agenda. Uh, another example, refugees risked everything to make this treacherous journey. خاطر اللاجئون بحياتهم وبكل ما يملكون ورموا بأنفسهم في آتون هذه الرحلة. آتون نأتي بها لأنها تعبر هنا عن هذا المعنى وكأنها نار سيحرقون فيها في هذه الرحلة المحفوفة بالمخاطر. Another example, Pakistan's Supreme Court has struck down the death sentence for blasphemy. And here the word is blasphemy on folks here, uh, handed over. He is the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi qadiyati tajdhifin turjimat. The Israeli um, government had the blood of the Palestinians killed in Sheikh Jarrah. يعني ونقول الحكومة الإسرائيلية ملطخة بدماء الفلسطينيين أو أيديها ملطخة بدماء الفلسطينيين الذين ممكن نقول استشهدوا في حي الشيخ جراح Another example attempting to cover its past crimes such as the use of comfort women by the army Comfort women, he is very problematic to translate. It is really cultural. Comfort women, turjimat, ala anha nisa al muta. But I think we need to revisit the translation to, uh, in a sense, in a sense, reflect that cultural uniqueness of the term comfort women. Break into a maximum security prison. Security lay safaqab al amin. هنا security can be interpreted as الحراسة اقتحام سجن شديد الحراسة uh, التحقق من صحة الادعاءات هنا التحقق بمعنى to ascertain and this is technical term الصحة هنا ليس بمعنى accuracy this is general vocabulary term here it's the validity and الادعاءات allegations and sometimes we say الادعاءات الباطلة malicious Uh, false allegations or الادعاءات فيها تجني malicious 
allegations in the legal culture, cultural context. The other example, ISIS saw death and destruction. الموت والدمار ويمكن أن نغيرها أيضا الزراعة لأن الزراعة يعني جيدة أن نزرع الشيء زرع قنابل أو زرع I don't think this is the right term to use because الزراعة أحيانا نقول يزرع ما يحصد أو يحصد ما يزرع عفوا وزراعة قد تكون شوك أيضا but it is used in the Arabic culture for something good so uh, I uh, do uh, uh, prefer to change that. The other uh, example, mouthings, lies, and fabrications. Uh, mouthings. Here, this is not really very much successful. Mouthings when you speak just lip service in a way. Uh, but here, uh, just saying nothing. Well, uh, after we do we do accept it. Now, with that, these examples, I would like to check with you uh, another term and word, which is resolution. And here, I would like to call Safa to display the uh, the uh, graph on resolution. Resolution has been studied in one of my uh, uh, papers uh, in a parallel corpse. How resolution is being translated in that corpse into Arabic and then those uh, target words, how they have been back translated into English and those back translations into back, back translation back into Arabic. So I would like to, uh, I'm not going to focus on that, but uh, the the um, target words are uh, displayed استشراب, استبانة, تسوية, قرار, حل, تسوية, etc. Now, I'm going to move on with another example. Example of Erez crossing. I have been called to interpret a sensitive meeting, confidential meeting of mediation between Israelis and Palestinians. And the mediation was conducted by a European country, a government of a European country. The, so the mediator was a, a former ambassador of that state into Jordan. And I had no clue about the subject at the time, and except for uh, the, the general topic on water resources and so on, they were going to discuss. And the uh, mediator said the following, and now we move on to discuss the problems pertaining to the Erez crossing. I interpreted it. And here the Palestinian delegate really stood up and protested against the interpreter, who was myself, stating, هذا ما Israeli, Palestini. And I apologized. And later on, after the meeting, he followed me, the guy from Gaza, and he told me, uh, Apologies, it was not you who was meant by the protest, dear friend. And I knew that. So here you need to. Uh, act and use some good offices and understand with experience that you were not the targeted person at that moment because it was a criticism for the mediator for being biased. Now, I will end with another story. Last week, I was interpreting in a high-level meeting. Yes. يمكن اختزال وختام لأنه تجاوزنا الوقت المحدد نعم. دقيقة واحدة وأختتم إن شاء الله. تفضل تفضل. شكرا. I was interpreting in a high level meeting. It was in the judiciary, a judicial official, and he happened to be from Algeria. And they were discussing some issues with. European counterparts. Now, the 
European delegate stated the following, I don't promise that we will fix the problems overnight and that uh, there will be a heaven on earth and spring will be back. The interpreter translated it as follows, لا أعدك لا أعدك بأن الأمور سيتم تسويتها بين عشية وضحاها وبأن الربيع سيحل وتعود العصافير تزقزق من جديد. So this is a sort of an a judicious intervention by the interpreter. Now, when he took the floor, the Arab official, the Algerian official, he stated the following: أنا أتفهم ذلك تماما. I really understand that. Uh, ولا نحن لا نصب إلى أن تعود العصافير لتزقزق فقط نتأكد من أنها بقيت على قيد الحياة. So uh, I we certainly uh, uh, do understand that we would love only to see the birds surviving and spring will come eventually. So here this is a very good example of that intervention and the interpreter has to clarify later on to the delegate that the metaphor of birds how it is used in the arabic culture and this is really uh, was very well received by the by the european delegate and they will end with a quote last word about interpreting the last slide please interpreting looks two ways. It opens up a passage and a heart, drawing near what might always remain afar. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and apologies for the internet issues. And I am really uh, keen uh, and, and I can take questions in English, Arabic or French. Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Blaiba. Blaib. شكرا thank you شكرا جزيلا لك استاذ بورك فيك على المداخله القيمه وهذا العرض المميز سواء من خلال الصور او من خلال الفيديوهات التي قدمتها والشروحات بالامثله بمختلف اللغات وترجمتها الى غير ذلك فاعتقد بانها يعني لاحظت انه حتى من خلال يعني الحضور وما علقوا عليها الكثير أعجبتهم المداخلة وهنالك بعض الأسئلة فمن بين الملاحظات أجد مثلا actually Mr. Hamouda I can't get enough of your talk this is so interesting and what a great experience you have وغيرها الكثير من المداخلات والتعليقات كانت مداخلات قيمة لا أدري إن كان هنالك أسئلة يمكن للحضور أن يطرحوها الآن في قسم المحادثة وسننقلها إلى الأستاذ حمودة أو إلى سيسيليا التي لا تزال متواجدة معنا فيمكننا نقلها شفهيا بارك الله فيكم بارك الله فيك بروفيسور أمتعتنا بمداخلتك القيمة فعلى ما يبدو لست الوحيد الذي استحسن وأعجبته هذه المداخلة سيسيليا هي متواجدة معنا يمكنها ربما أن تلتحق بنا هل لديكم ربما تعليقات Do you have any comments, any um, additions, any uh, questions? So uh, the panelists are here except Mr. Nolan you can um, discuss or um, share thoughts أستاذ بالعالية أه لا أعرف إذا كانت هناك حتى أسئلة بعد هذا اللقاء فيمكن أن نتواصل مع الحضور الكريم ومن يريد أو من يرغب في طرح هذه الأسئلة أه حتى بعد أه هذا المؤتمر أه لنناقشها سوية وإذا كانت هناك أسئلة أه كما قلت فيمكن أن نجيب على عنها الآن بالفعل إذا لدي سؤال هنا Dr. Salahi, don't you think that these judicious interventions clash 
with the duty of the interpreter to be impartial. There is a fine line between preserving the accuracy, polishing someone's statement. Uh, can I answer now? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know who asked the question, but thank you very much for this very good it question. Is Anwar. Anwar. Anwar, thank you. Thank you, dear Anwar. Um, certainly, I, I agree with you, but still, these judicious interventions are really not, uh, not being used uh, uh, almost always or randomly, but still, I think that a, a competent interpreter has the power and the freedom to see the exchange and to judge, like a judge here and a mediator, to say whether this is appropriate, whether it is appropriate to make that intervention. But sometimes if you don't make, if you don't make that intervention, there might be some clash, there might be some conflict, like the example of the uh security officer who brought the piece of bread if you do not intervene and add some cultural element then there might be a clash between him and the other officers and here you are a messenger of peace you are not a messenger of war certainly thank you thank you so much um can I add one comment, practical comment on how to do this? Because yeah. I understand their reticence, um, especially from conference interpreting training, that we should never meddle with the message. And as diplomatic interpreters, sometimes we have to, as uh, Dr. Hemurasa is very well saying. So sometimes um, what I do, it all depends on the situation the level of formality and how much I can interact with my client. But usually, I mean, it's very, I mean, it's, if it is a very high level thing, like the ones that you see on TV where you have the two heads of state with the interpreters behind, that is the most formal setting. And there, there's nothing that you can do. Sometimes you can, and you are whispering to your clients here. So you can clarify, you can let them know if it is important and you're nervous about it. Just so you know, I clarify this for cultural reference sake. And that's it. It's also part of having your clients back, which is what we do as diplomatic interpreters. And um, those cultural um, references that sometimes are missing, sometimes is when we are interpreting the message. Sometimes it's not even when we are interpreting. And uh, just a very lighthearted anecdote I was um, accompanying a minister, minister for international trade for Latin American country. And it was after his presentation and his lecture and he was networking. And he was approached by um, the representatives of the Scottish uh, Beverages Association or something like that. And they were talking about a very classic brand of gin called Bee Features Gin in the UK. And they were talking about the bee features chain. And I could tell the minister was completely lost and he was nodding without knowing what they were talking about. So I approached us as if they were, I was going to tr interpret. But instead I said, if a brand of gin, that's very traditional. So behind his back, he gave me a thumbs up. He said, okay, got it. So um, you need to assess the situation. There's a constant, constant decision making. And you need to assess the situation, when to intervene, when not to, when to ask for clarification, when not to. And every single time you can, keep your client up to date with what's happening at the time or afterwards. Or you can agree beforehand as well, which I did with uh, the Argentine delegation when they were coming to discuss the uh, Falklands, which is the Malvinas Islands, you know, the war between the UK and Argentina, and they're still fighting. And one call is called the islands one way, the other one's called the island the other way. And so I had to agree with my client how we wanted to call the islands. So we were, then you do that beforehand. So it all depends. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, so there is a question from um, Mr. Hamisi, a senior interpreter here in Algeria. As you referred for, uh, to interpreting cultural issues, how do you cope with interpreting idioms, puns, proverbs, jokes, etc., which puts the interpreter often in an awkward situation? Uh, shall I answer the yes, question? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, would you like me to answer in English or in Arabic? Uh, depends, I don't know. Like you want. Okay, in English there is an Arabic in interpreter, English. so no problem. Excellent. So here, I think uh, the interpreter, when going to uh, a conference, has to get prepared. For example, some of my colleagues and I were interpreting for conferences called a dawa uh it was a conference uh, initiated by the former uh, leader of president muammar gaddafi and the people over there the, uh, the delegates were quoting and citing quran and the sunnah uh, quite often so here you get prepared and we do uh, work in pairs in the sense that uh, when there is a verse of quran cited uh, somebody else would check for it, uh, some the translation, and the uh, on mic interpreter would read it, simply read it. And with regard to now proverbs and other uh, those those forms of idiomatic expressions and so on, I think uh, this uh, really adds uh, to your inter uh, to the interpreting uh, to uh, um, to make it sound much more. Uh, uh, professional and good quality performance and if you have recourse to it now if you don't just explain what is being said uh, but if you can for example uh, one delegate might say and now we move on to the uh, to the to, to the the best part the hardcore of everything to discuss about money and fun funding here if he were speaking in Arabic he would have uh, said something like that. I can add it, even though it is not being said in the original uh, uh, speech. And if you have something very similar, then we can end uh, least but not uh, last, etc. So there are some uh, conventional equivalences at proverb uh, level. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yes, Cecilia. Go so, ahead. and um, this also helps perhaps uh, clarify one of the questions from the chat as well regarding translating and interpreting in diplomatic settings. So, when we are interpreting, it, first of all, it's not a black and white situation. Uh, every conversation is like, I'm not, I don't want to say 50 because it's not the cultural reference. Let's say it's 1,000 shades of gray. That's diplomacy. So we, we have very, so the spectrum of, of, of conversation, formality, register, language, variety, there are so many things at play. So we need to read the situation very well. Humor is the, I, thought, I would say, is, is a natural way of trying to break the ice, especially in certain cultures. And that is the purpose of it. So if it is tricky, humor is always tricky, but you need to see beyond what the joke is. What's the purpose of the joke? To break the ice. Maybe you can use that instead of having to rely on words. And there are so many experiences and, and, and anecdotes about this. I had a Mexican um, um, minister who kept making the joke in Spanish, apparently, it's very funny to say, like Jack the Reaper said, let's take it piece by piece. And he kept making the joke saying, we're going to go one point at a time. That's what he wanted to say. And he thought it was hilarious. But I wasn't interpreting it. I was saying, let's go little by little. So he asked me, I, I didn't interpret you once, and then he said, I wanted to interpret my joke. And he said, well, your joke is not going to work because it's not funny, he said, but I want you to do it. Okay, so we made a deal over lunch. He said, I will interpret it, and then you decide whether you want me to continue to interpret it. And what happened was what I knew. 
the, half the table was laughing and half the meeting table was looking at him and saying, but are you crazy? What's going on with this guy? And then he said, okay, now I believe you. So you need to read the situation and that happens. When we are translating Proverbs, we also have to monitor ourselves. Because sometimes there are expressions that in my Spanish, my Argentine Spanish mean one thing, and they exist in other Latin American countries, and they mean another. So when in doubt, go to the standard. What's the worst that can happen? That a joke is lost? If the joke just wants to break the ice, I mean, breaking the ice is just one split second in an entire negotiation. Move on. I mean, you have to learn to let go, okay? Then sometimes it's not easy in your personal lives when you're interpreting. Let go, let go, let go, okay? And also, and this was, again, experience, be very much aware, and, and you live and learn, and that's how you learn it, about our own preconceptions. So we were interpreting, um, it was a conference and a meeting related to Judaism. So it was about Jewish culture, and there was this... Um, um, rabbi who was talking and he was first of all using English and Hebrew, Hebrew which okay. meant that I had to get my Spanish which is naturally 30% longer into the English so I didn't overlap with his Hebrew because the audience understood Hebrew but I don't yeah. and then when using certain words he was saying the sacredness of he was talking the sacred sacredness of the Torah and I just said, la santidad, which is the holiness. And I immediately checked myself and said, no, that's my upbringing from a Catholic country. And that's not the upbringing of a, a, a Jewish culture. So you need to monitor yourself that way. What happens? You correct yourself. And if necessary, you apologize. But um, take the stress out of, yes, proper is humor thing and try to see what's behind it sometimes it's about giving a touch of color making the discourse richer well we have our voice if there's a proverb that tries to convey openness and warmth i can use my voice i don't have to use mm -hmm. just words because there's a whole lot of me that's providing the interpretation Otherwise, I just let Google Translate do it or Siri exactly. and I stay home. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what we mean when we say context. Yeah. And all those yes. things are at play. And you could even get somebody saying something and making gestures that actually communicate the opposite. Mm -hmm. So what will you communicate? The words or the gesture or the contradiction? <laughs> exactly. You see? And sometimes the um, gestures are different from uh, one culture Obviously, to another. Yes. A yes could mean a no in exactly. some places. <laughs> exactly. And that's that's the, the context is, I mean, it's, it's way bigger. I mean, you need to read the situation, read the person, read what's going on and read the meaning. That's what we talk about meaning and what's the intention behind it. Okay. I always say, if, if you have had experience interacting with English diplomats and government officials and things, you probably know the word lovely. It's lovely where they were. Lovely, lovely means at least 150 different things. It rarely means lovely. Yeah. Okay? Like so, the Arabic word, inshallah. Exactly. inshallah. exactly. And that's why I believe that if you want to be a good diplomatic interpreter, you need to be immersed in the cultures that you're working with. Totally it's agree. a must. Yeah. yeah, it is. May I uh, take uh, just one minute or less to comment on jokes, translation of jokes? Yeah, there is uh, just one saying I uh, spotted quickly. Uh, yes, please. I think it was Mr. Shayib who said, um, yeah. Take care of the meaning, and the words will take care of themselves. Of themselves exactly. I think it is a very yeah, good it is saying. A perfect saying. Yeah. Yeah. I totally the agree. situation. It, it's it's yes. the triangle, Danica Seleskiewicz triangle, when you go and you yes. extract the meaning, the meaning, and things. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I have interviewed the um, uh, president of uh, the European Court of Justice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he told me that we asked all of the delegates 
coming to the court not to tell jokes because the speeches uh, are translated into 28 languages and then with the relay and long people so with not half laughing and the other not uh, the other half of the audience yeah. not laughing but you will hear the German speakers laughing now, and then after 30 seconds, the French speakers, and then the Romanian, and so on. So this created some chaos. So they have warned all of the delegates not to tell jokes. This is the, other, uh, the first thing. The other thing, and um, I have shared with you, uh, allow me uh, to call you Fauzi, and please call me Hamouda. Yes, yes, please. Uh, link, uh, it's a very short, 30 seconds at least, and I subtitled it into English about a call of a delegate official who is Tunisian official not to translate certain stuff. So under, I called it under interpreting. So here you need to judge again by the context, especially this is in community interpreting and in uh, sometimes uh, interpreting in a uh, diplomatic setting. So uh, did you receive the, the, the link? Yes, uh, it is the one you shared here. On yes, the chat box, I'm, right? On the chat box, yes, please. Okay. So I, yes. Okay. <laughs> Here is another example of uh, the delegates, the participants in, the, in the, the discussion calling the interpreter not to translate certain things and sometimes to judge the thing from the context. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um... yes, and, and in that, and, and in, in those situations which happen, um, it might sound very harsh, but uh, with a request like that, I would just follow the instructions on the person that's signing my check, because that's my client. It's, 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 if the client says, "I want you to call the islands this way," well, that's what I do with the client, and then probably the next day I'm interpreting for the opposite party. And then I call them the way they want. So it, it is a collaboration and you need to talk to your clients, especially before going into a diplomatic setting. Yeah, exactly. definitely. The issue of loyalty is very problematic. Loyalty to yeah. whom? Thank you. Yeah. And that's so why in very high levels question. you have two interpreters. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. One Thank for you. each. Um, one second. So we have a question. Let's take the last one. How do you handle situations? The question is for Cecilia from Mr. Shaib. How do you handle situations where some people claiming they are bilingual interfere with you interpreting? And it happens a lot. <laughs> okay. Before I answer that one, Anwar said not a legal, a legal context. A legal context is not a diplomatic context, mm -hmm. which is the whole premise of what we are discussing today. Court interpreting required has other requirements. So the logic that you apply to conference, to court, or to public services, and to diplomatic is different. And regarding um, bilingual, <laughs> with a lot of patience, that's all I can say. You, you will come across so many things. You will come across people in the meeting who believe they can do your job better. I have come across situations where I walk into a room and they have the secretary or somebody, the intern, there just in case. I had people, personal embassy staff who they think they can do it and then they cannot. So what do you do? You remain calm. You understand that clients have been burned in the past. Everybody has some sort of horrendous, horror, terrible story of an interpreter that didn't work, didn't know how to do the job. So there's, there's, there's a little bit of disregard for what we do. How you handle it, you take care of your thing, your poise, your composure, your tone, your confidence is going to communicate to your client everything that you do, the tone that you voice, the voice that you use, how you sit down. And then I, I usually describe it as the 
back against, you know, the backs down, the backs against the back of the chair effect. And when you start interpreting, it only takes about five seconds to people realize that they can trust you. And that also okay. is experience. But you need to rely on yeah. that. Yeah. And once you have that trust, you're good. But they're going to test you. And if you look at every time you're doing um, consecutive, and there's a bilingual audience, I mean, you, if you pay attention, they are sort of mentally ticking that you're saying everything. And they go, mm -hmm. they nod their heads because they are checking. It's, it's, it's not on purpose. It's just part of it, part of, of, of what happens. People are curious. You just, you know, be patient and kind and confident and do your job tremendously well. Exactly. So, so on these wise words, let's uh, finish our session. And um, I would like to thank you again for your patience, first of all, and for the valuable valuable information you presented and shared with us today. Um, but we are a little bit late, so I'm sorry for those who ask questions on the comment section and the, the chat. Uh, we will have to finish this session uh, right now. So what will happen is uh, we will keep uh, the live on this platform. We will take 10 or 15 minutes of break. Um, and the next session, the plenary one, will start just uh, after, after 10 minutes or 15 minutes. As for the uh, live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, uh, we will stop it right now. And when the second session starts, we will launch a second part of it. So don't worry, even for those who are uh, looking for a recording, you will have um, the um, videos on those uh, social media. So thank you so much. Thank you again. And uh, see you later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you.